Welcome. Welcome to this nighttime session where we're trying to answer what is the best horror game of our lifetime. And for this special occasion, I have invited Sam. Welcome, Sam. Hi. We have actually asked ourselves this question, and the question was phrased a bit differently. It was, is Alien Isolation specifically the best horror <sighs> game of our lifetime? <laughs> or even more precisely, is there anything that can surpass Alien Isolation? It makes sense that you invited me for this. There's a great educational value because I know very, very little about horror games. I can enjoy them to their fullest potential due to my propensity for fear. What is your stance on horror games today? Because this definitely has changed over the years for you. I think I have become more tolerant, but it's <laughs> not less painful. The thing about horror games for me is the stories and the themes are often really, really appealing to me. And then I find myself wanting to literally run away and scream. A healthy reaction, I think, to enjoy all these games <laughs> that we have on our list here, that we brought here to be judged most harshly. Right. Our ranking system, our tiers, range from S rank, from top of the line and legend status. So these are games that both of us, or at least I, have played more than once, most likely, or I would play more than once, games you would recommend to basically anyone. Recommendable and would replay are, as the tier says, games that you would recommend and you would replay at least once. Then you have the category in which most games usually fall, play and forget. You find them or you play them on release, mm. but it's nothing to really return to, so nothing really grabbed you or made you think for a long time after finishing it. And because there's not really a use in defining more than a few top tier, and I'm not really a fan of defining a lot of middle ground, we immediately move into the flawed and lost me category. Right. Very self-descriptive. If you didn't finish a game or you just think this is just not, this is just not working out. And then it goes further down into the negative abysmal and please unrelease. So this is our cry to the developer or the publisher, whoever's most responsible for whatever mess is going to be put in here. Please take it back. Please, this, this shouldn't be on the market. And we have a category here for horror games that get a free pass to not be judged as a horror game. And of course, because not all games here are in my Steam library, or yours, I guess, we have the unknown and did not play it here. All right. All right. Let's jump in. The first game we're going to rank is Alien Isolation. Oh. Of course, it's top of the line. It's legend status. It's the entire reason for this video. Can you explain why? Yes. So Alien Isolation, Creative Assembly, released in 2014. I don't think Creative Assembly ever made any horror games before or after this one. So very peculiar product. It is the only good Alien game that I ever played. There are no other Alien games in this collection, which probably speaks for itself. The specialty of Alien Isolation is in AI, because it's a game with an unpredictable enemy. It has, for much of its playtime, one major enemy. There are other obstacles, other dangers on board of Sevastopol, the station that you're trapped on for most of the game. There is you, Amanda Ripley, and the alien. And the alien doesn't move like your usual monster. For the most part, no predefined paths. It just is trapped on the station, just the same as you are. And even though you have weapons, this is a, one of the horror games of our list where you are armed, you can only as much as push it back for a moment, but it will return and it will be probably very angry with you. We will talk more about the qualities as needed when there come games that challenge it. I can say about Alien Isolation that for me this is the game that really raised the bar for horror for me because previously, once you understand the way that the game works and tries to scare you, it becomes less scary. And Alien just is built around not letting you do that. Yeah, not only does the Alien walk its own past, it also learns from your mistakes. If you want to spend a lot of time in lockers, it will also check the locker. So not only does it move its own paths, it also actively tries to move into your hiding spaces. Yeah. And I guess in big contrast, it can also access all the places you can go. You don't really have any safe rooms throughout the game. It teaches you early on that not even the safe stations, where you have to manually save, not even those are safe. The only steps the game takes towards you is 
telling you if you are <laughs> in danger at the safe station. We'll do more comparisons further down the line. So the next space, the next space, yes, of course, the next game is Dead Space. I think released in 2007, Visceral Games, now defunct, shut down by Electronic Arts. Yeah, big entry, big title. I mean, this one started with a big budget and it ended with an even bigger budget. A very worthy entry. I played Dead Space, I think, twice or three times myself. Did you ever play Dead Space? I, I don't think I did. played the first 20 minutes alone in my room when I was a young boy, and then I did not play anymore. Were you chased into the elevator? The trauma is deep, but it's not detailed. I remember seeing one creature and saying to myself, no. So Dead Space, I would say, it is excellent. It is a great game. It was an entry at a time where there were already more survival horror games. I think it deserves a very high spot. I think this is legend status. I oh think we, we start we start off strong with two space horror games. There's something about space that is probably inherently horrific, yeah. uh, which is the exact theme of the entire game of Dead Space. I'm impressed. I didn't know it was so good, but I guess if it beat me in 20 minutes, that's a good sign. It has action, like Alien Isolation. It has great gameplay aside the scare factor. Speaking of action, Dead Space 2, <gasps> it's a weird one because Dead Space 2 focuses more on action, but it's also more polished. Uh -huh. On the gunplay side, it does similar things as Mass Effect to Mass Effect 2 ah, did. Yeah, a streamlining combat. So more diverse locations, less repetition, some more lived in spaces instead of, you know, like a killing floor level after the fifth round. <laughs> Still the same formula, but less of a horror game. I remember liking it, but I actually quit my second playthrough of it because oh. it was too frustrating in the childcare level. I think this is a... A recommendable? It is between these two because I wanted to replay, but then I didn't like replaying it. You so would replay. You it? did say that you would replay. Yeah, I would replay. It's not you did replay, replayed. it's would replay. Yeah, okay, let's leave it in recommended. Well, we're off to a strong start then. Yeah, seem to start with a few of the good ones. The next one is, of course, Dead Space 3 ah. down here. And this one is our first prime example for Please Unrelease. I would oh, ask, okay. Electronic Arts, please take back Dead Space 3. It had a lot of action focus. There was no horror in it, as far as I can remember. And I didn't finish it. I played it to some of the weird glacier levels that it has, where you have to do some quick time events, some oh, climbing. Wow. It had a lot of human-to-human uh, -human combat, in parentheses, unmutated. It just was <laughs> completely unenjoyable. And I think even weirder, it was built for co-op. And that should say all there is to say. Wow. This is very much like the Mass Effect progression. I love how you said unmutated with so much disgust. <laughs> <laughs> Almost sounds like this is not a horror game, but I feel like you yeah. just don't want to give it a free pass. This is, of course, what I would read in the comments if we had comments. Dead Space 3 will be judged as a horror game because the series wants to be a horror series. We will come to games like Bioshock, spoilers, where some of the games in, in the series were proper horror games and we can rank them as such. But Dead Space 3, it's not suddenly a philosophical adventure walking simulator like Bioshock Infinite. On the Jewel case, it will say it is a horror game, I'm pretty sure. First of all, I think Dead Space 3 has the extra added horror of the downfall of Visceral Games, which might qualify it. This really reopens the discussion that Deadly Premonition is not on this list. Oh, wow. And you could you could really find a few games from the jam aisle that would qualify as a yeah. horror game just because it's a horror that they exist, but not to you as a player. So <laughs> I guess we have to say we have to say the games in here are horror from a mm. player's perspective and not from a, a customer's perspective, from yeah, a publisher's yeah, yeah. perspective. Deadly Premonition is, is really is less of a horror game than it is a development horror game. Yes. Like yes. performance horror. <laughs> historic downfall, the downpour of... We, we have a game called Downpour and Downfall in this list, so... Amazing. Things tend to go down in horror games, I guess. Yeah, do we have any up games in here? Bioshock Infinite? I don't think... Yeah, well, okay. But up nothing the game. up in the title. What prepositions do we have in stock here? We have within, mm -hmm. we have inside. Hmm. We don't, we don't I have... I guess that's many. it. 
So yeah, that's the entirety of the Dead Space series. Next up, Plague Tale. Plague Tale Innocence. This is French developer Azobo Studios. Innocence is a game with the formula of a lighter The Last of Us, a French historic uh, Last of Us, um, more fantasy elements than Last of Us. This borders on not a horror game, I would say. I was going to say the it, same thing because I've played this yeah. about halfway through and enjoyed it. <laughs> Meaning you weren't scared. Uh, yeah, yes, and, I have to clarify that. Yeah. yeah, when I enjoy a game, it might, usually it, it has little to do with me being scared. It, it definitely has gore, which is often a signifier for horror. It also has a supernatural evil and a lot of darkness. In fact, you have yeah. to use light to navigate through the darkness. Evil entities chasing you. There are some panic states. I guess it's more similar to Little Nightmares than, than The Last of Us. It's very confined puzzles that are more escape puzzles than anything else. I don't think I want to rank it as a horror game. So it gets a free yeah. pass, huh? Because it would be up there. Yeah, okay, generally speaking, I did enjoy it. I think this needs to get a free pass because it doesn't really try to be a horror game, and it is also other genres. The most honor that we can give to this double A title, not quite a horror game. And then the same thing would go for the new Plague Tale Requiem. As far as I played it, it ticks the exact same formula uh, boxes. And not much to say about free pass games, much more to say <laughs> about Outlast. Oh my. It is a double A game, very independent when Red Barrels started out. It's becoming old, it's aging, it's an aging game mm -hmm, now. Mm -hmm. Outlast became popular because it was one of the bigger titles where you didn't have any weapons at all. You don't carry much around beside your tape camcorder with infinite tape, but not infinite batteries. It's one of these battery collecting games. I think we have oh, okay. more than one on this list. If there's something that Outlast is not, it's nuanced. Outlast does not know what a grayscale is. It's full scripted chase sequence or complete silence. That sounds like it would terrify me to death, actually. It, yeah, Outlast would terrify you because it has a lot of the same mechanics as Alien Isolation. We should, should make our ears perk up uh, saying that, but Outlast is also very predictable. I think I replayed Outlast, or I played it in total at least twice. I played the Whistleblower DLC that we just going to wordlessly include in this one. We don't have DLC in this list. It is a good game. It is a solid, a solid horror game, but it will be much less scary on your second and third playthrough. I think this still has to go in recommendable it is it is a recommendable it's not hard okay. to recommend outlast it's just it's just a bit it's painfully blatant mm -hmm. this is the official label i'm going to give it it's painfully blatant you can just watch an enemy walk its rounds and you could walk through an empty level without any npcs and you would know the exact kind of gameplay uh, that's going to go down there Maybe we just have these exact presumptions because of Outlast. Genre-defining, almost. Genre-strengthening. It makes it almost legendary. It definitely has legend status for, for many people. I think it ranks above Dead Space 2. Oh yeah, definitely. So let's put it at the borderlands of legend status, at least. Okay. We'll see. We'll Fair. see if it stays there. We'll see if someone takes its throne. Even if we never find, in all of our lifetimes, in all of our combined lifetimes, another <laughs> game to ever beat Alien Isolation, can we find games that at least beat the A tier? We're looking for relative champions here. Did you play Outlast? I did not, and do not plan to. Right. Even though it is recommendable. I'll make sure to recommend it the next time somebody asks me for a horror game recommendation. Good idea, good idea. Yeah, that, that, should, that should be enough. So, of course, Outlast 2, because this game also had a sequel. This is more recent, much worse than Outlast 1 in my book. And I, I was really looking forward to this one. A more polished Outlast. Also had much better graphics. I think they switched engines. It looks very different. It, it looks very Unreal Engine 4. Not sure Great. if it actually was. Did they add any other colors beside a green? Yes, it has more colors. That's one of the features on the game case. Besides first bullet point, it's a horror game. There are definitely some, some horror fans out there that would say Outlast is the modern prototypal survival horror game. Yeah, I can see that. Um, 
in comparison, Alien Isolation Outlast, you don't have any weapons, so you can't fight back no matter what kind of enemy is thrown your way. Mm -hmm. Alien Isolation, you have different kinds of enemies, and only the alien you can't fight at all. Yeah, Outlast 2, I, I was looking forward to it because I like the setting. So Outlast 1, it's set in a sanatorium. You're heading to the sanatorium as a journalist. That's why you only got your camera and not some, some assortment of, of weaponry to go in there. Outlast 2 is just set in some rural, it's not even a town, it's more like a settlement that has no connection to the outside world. It was very appealing. But what they made of it is not what I hoped for. It's definitely a horror game. It doesn't get a free pass. I think this is the perfect example for Flawed. I did complete it, but yeah, there's no reason to ever replay it. And Outlast 2 is, I think, one of the few games that you could make a funny montage out of it because it has a lot of scripted chase sequences. It's less quick time events than finding the right turn to take at first try because if you fail, you're just going to play the exact same thing. Yeah. That is the Outlast series. Next up is, oh, next up is nothing less than Five Nights at Freddy's. Oh, lovely. Lovely. Well, I've heard this one is very good, right? Yeah, I've also occasionally heard that. And this is a uh, stand-in for all the uncountable Five Nights at Freddy's games. The Five Nights at Freddy's tier list video, like, is, uh, that'll, that'll come is next. It, yeah, there are, there are, even on Tier Maker, there are just tier list for Five Nights at Freddy's games. Wow. This would be their own category. We, we, we don't have as much time. and It would just be a list of, uh, full of everything in, in Legend status, right? Exactly. Exactly the opposite. I <laughs> played some, it's just... The prime example of something so unappealing that I just don't want to play it. I think my main issue with the FNAF games, besides the apparent reasons of its fan base, it's a, a parade of disjointed game mechanics. Mm -hmm. It's like you take the least appealing parts of many of these titles, not yet ranked, and try to mash them in a single game. I do think it has an appeal. I like the mix in the first one of having to protect your little security guard booth and then also having these pixelated mini games that explain a bit of the quote lore of Five Nights at Freddy's. Mm -hmm. A very interesting concept. I just think it's abysmally executed. It's unnecessarily punishing. It's a panic based game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think it has much to give mechanically to really be enjoyable. It's a game to be endured than to be gotcha. enjoyed. Gotcha, it's like a sort of sadistic pleasure. The thing is, if maybe half of the FNAF formula was different, it may as well be up here. It may even be right here, because there are some similarities. I just think that FNAF fails in all of them. <laughs> both of these are very taxing to watch and taxing to play. So both of these translate very well into into video form. Which is great for Let's Plays, but Alien manages to also be a good game. For me, maybe it's it's between these two. It is somewhat abysmal, but maybe Lost Me is a better label. I, I mean, if you wanna, if, I, I feel like you would like to put it in abysmal. I think it still deserves some recognition for the weird series that it is. Though, on the other hand, it also doesn't stand its ground because there were so many games. This is not a consistent series of games. When I sometimes find the random FNAF video on the YouTube recommended page, then a new entry, FNAF 17 Hotel Terror, and it's a completely different setting, some piece of the story maybe, maybe not even canon. Even if we had the 407 other FNAF games in this list, I would just queue them up. This tier would just be full, and wherever the first one is, the other ones will go, probably with a downward slope. Alright, way too much time spent on Five Nights at Freddy's. Next one is Darkwood. Darkwood is top-down, almost 2D. It's also very good. You know, it looks yeah. nice because it's not first-person, so it looks like something I might even be able to play. Like, how do you do a jump scare in that sort of camera angle? You say that, but Fran Bao jump scared both of us. Yeah. Uh, and I think more than once. And this is a completely 2D One game, like hand drawn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a special one, though. So uh, you haven't played Darkwood? No. I haven't played too much of it. It did lose me, but it's not flawed. 
it didn't lose me because it was flawed. Probably more that you'd need a certain an affinity for this kind of game. It's probably something that I would play again sometime, so maybe this is just going to be our first entry in Play and Forget. Yeah. Now it's going to get more interesting. Finally, it's going to get interesting because Bioshock is the next game in our list. Oh, really? So you did play Bioshock, right? Uh, about half. <laughs> okay. Why did you stop? Why, why did you... It's uh, scary. Ah, so it is a horror game, you would say. Interesting, yeah. I mean, so I played it in like 2011 for the first time. Mm -hmm. So three years after it came out. Yes, three or four, yeah. And uh, it did not work for me. I was too scared. Also, I was bad at video games then because I had just So it, it did just work gotten... for you. So I, I guess it did, yeah. If you have to quit out of a horror game because it was too scary, then it did work. Good point. Yeah, then so straight up to legend status then for me. Actually, Dead Space killed me after 20 minutes. So so Bioshock, I did a few hours. Maybe more of a recommendable. I don't know. I also played Bioshock. I played it at least twice, four, probably three times in total. Bioshock is a horror game, I think. The trailers presented it more as a horror game than an action game. Maybe socio-political horror. Mm -hmm. um, the downfall of the city. A game of legend status, but is it a horror game of legend status? Mm. And because I'm the one of the two of us that replayed it, it is not at all scary on replay. <laughs> you're just too powerful. You're too armed. But you're saying uh, new game plus or generally you're too No, powerful. just fresh, fresh replay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, new game plus everyone is too armed. So in terms of rating it as a horror game, Bioshock is a game of legend status, but the horror part of Bioshock is play and forget. Mm, I see what you're saying. The horror part of it is just decent. Don't think of it as being rated badly here, that the horror part of it very quickly evaporates on replay, and maybe even during the first playthrough. Once you carry around the grenade launcher, mm. it's just not the same. All of these are more punishing. Dead Space has manual saving, Alien Isolation has manual saving, and Outlast is just punishing despite the saving. Does that work for you? That does work for me, yeah. I just remembered that I replayed Bioshock about a year ago, and I played on easy or normal difficulty just because I just wanted to get through the story and not like spend a lot of time in the game. And it was still extremely hard because enemies just had absurd amounts of health and would run away and heal themselves after I spent all my ammo on them, and then I wouldn't have any ammo. <laughs> and it wasn't hard to beat as a horror game. It was just No, it a was hard just game. weirdly bad. A hard action game. Yeah. I had this one enemy that was running in circles over and over again, and I would chase him around the entire map, beat him with the melee weapon until he had run all the way around back to the health station that had respawned in between, mm -hmm. and then he would just heal again, and I would beat him to death again, and then he would heal again, and that would happen several times over and over. Nice. Very strange. All right, obligatory... Bioshock 2, then? Yes, yes. Maybe even less of a horror game. You're now even more powerful. You're... Not even a human in you, this one. You are the big daddy, right? So you are the source of the horror. Yeah. But it's more gory and dark. It is the exact same formula, though. So then putting it right next to the first one. Really? Making okay. this easy. Yeah. And Bioshock Infinite, different setting. This is the game for which the not a horror game tier was invented. This is just not scary at all. And it also doesn't want to be a horror game. The major difference is... Bioshock and Bioshock 2 have scary settings. They have mm -hmm. darkness and griminess and you're underwater. And Bioshock Infinite and just has a scary amount of uh, convolution in the plot. It is politically scary. Political scariness doesn't belong in the horror genre. That is realism. Okay, this was the Bioshock series. Now we have a treat with our first Bloober Team game, Blair Witch. Yeah, Blair Witch, I think 2021, very recent. It's one of these games that have a good visual facade. I think it's also Unreal Engine 4. I don't know what you do in this game. I, all I know is that there's a dog and you can pet it. Yeah. Which for me would mean legend status, because that's the type of game that I like, comfy dog petting yeah, games. Yeah, we can, we can work on the can you pet a an animal tier list <laughs> next. And F tier would be where you just shoot uh, all the animals. Jesus Christ. All the Far Cry games are high up in that tier list. 
And we don't we don't have any Far Cry games in here. Um, yeah, Blair Witch, you're just uh, you're some guy. Um, you're in in the woods, and it's a Bloober Team game, so it's extremely scripted. It will be the exact same game if you play it more than once. You will see all the jump scares from a mile away, and story wise, they are light. Hmm. So they've got very little of anything. Yeah. If I had played any more of this, it at least lost me. <laughs> it has definitely flowed like Bloober Team. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely flawed. My goodness. The only question would be if I would ask Bloober Team to unrelease it. And I don't have a reason for that. It's not actively terrible, it's just empty. The next one, Prey. That's not the Prey I know. That's Prey. This is some Native American space portal horror Interesting. game. Interesting. <laughs> but unfortunately, I personally haven't played it. it will have to go into Unknown Did Not Play, but would play. Would play. So this okay, is yeah, not, not a judgment. The fact that it has portals is interesting to me because it's it's earlier than the game Portal, right? It's definitely older than Portal. Yeah. Wow. The wild thing is, if you Google Prey now, you don't even get the 2017 or whatever it was game. You just get the new film from 2022 about Predator, which is weirdly also set in uh, like an indigenous American context. Hmm. Also, Predator exists in the same universe as Alien does, right? So... No. No? I thought that was the whole thing, the crossover between Predator and Alien. Yeah, let's just um, not talk about that. I was just hoping that maybe Prey was vaguely related to our champion and thus, you know... <laughs> this is not a Predator game. <laughs> and if it was a Predator game, I really doubt that it would even be in Recommendable. We could have easily found a Predator game and put it on this list, but that's not what happened. So next up is, of course, Prey. What? Yeah, Arcane Studios, the developers of Dishonored. Oh no, I like this one. Uh, there are scary parts in it, but I feel like it might not actually be a horror game. I think Prey, even though it's a heavy sci-fi game, it is marketed as a horror game as well. Prey is one of the, the weird entries where I probably have three-digit playtime oh, on wow. Steam, but still never finished it. Aside from the fact that there are goo spiders that turn into tables and microwaves, I don't really remember any of it being particularly scary. For me, what I think mostly peeves me about horror games is the, the fear of being jump scared. And in Prey, mm -hmm. the fact that any, any object can instantly turn into an enemy. Um, instilled that fear. If you like the the fear of being jump scared, you should try a Bloober Team game. Because to me, they're barely horror games. To you, they might be just right. Wait, I didn't say I like the fear of being jump scared. The fear <laughs> of being jump scared is. Did what? you not? Oh God. <laughs> Despite how much I would love to see it succeed, it did lose me. <gasps> I think twice. Oh man. And it lost me in all the genres that it was. It lost me being a horror game, and it unfortunately also lost me in being an immersive sim action role-playing game. It is flawed. It is better, of course, than all of these entries, if it would finally move in here. Wow. It was close, but somehow it still fell apart. Maybe it wanted to do too much, or, or the horror wasn't strong enough. I would have liked a game with these mechanics. It's like you could take, it's it's with Little Nightmares too. You can take small sections of levels and build entire games out of them. And with Prey, I would have wished the same. I would play a game with mimics where yeah, every table yeah. could transform into a monster, but then the monster would have to be scary or at least threatening. Now we move way more into the indie corner with Bran Bow. Oh my goodness, that's one of my favorites. That is a definite favorite. This was created by Swedish developer Kill Monday Games. Friend Bauer is a point and click puzzle adventure. I'm not a point and click expert or admirer. The point and click puzzles in Friend Bauer worked better than most of the point and click games I ever played. And more than a point and click game and more than an adventure game, Friend Bauer is a proper horror game. And it is, it is scary, it has jump scares, and the jump scares are also part of its story part of the experience of the character as well yeah. as you as, as the player. It goes so far as to have what we always referred to as a jump scare button. Yes, Friend Bow is maybe even unique here. 
that it has voluntary jump scares that still work. <laughs> voluntary self-scaring. Jump... This is definitely going to go high up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's at least a play and forget. I played it more than once, so no, it it's, is it's a replay. recommendable. I would, I would replay this immediately. And that's crazy because just the fact that I had control over the scariness a little bit. Oh my goodness. To me, yeah. a more competent game. And it had a much more interesting story. Yeah. It has a story that is horror on more levels than one. You know how when we play a horror game together, you always have to keep me from pressing escape all the time to go into the pause <laughs> menu? That, I think, is built into Rambo choosing when to expose yourself to the scariness by pressing the jump scare button. And that was enough for me to enjoy the horror aspect of it. So the takeaway being that the next time we play a horror game together, you just let me press escape all the time and play in intervals of 10 seconds. Certain games, you just have to play slowly from locker to locker. Maybe we should go even further, because mm -hmm. I don't really see any reason not to put it in Legend status. Oh my goodness. Very promising for their future. Does that bring us to the next game, also made by Kill Monday? Yes. Little Misfortune, also a point-and-click adventure game. It's surprisingly not a horror game. Little Misfortune is amazing. I'm shorter than Friend Bao, but it has higher production quality. It has voice acting now. It's something that lovers of horror games would enjoy, but it's not exactly a horror game. Great. Right, next up is Downfall, Harvester Games. Downfall is a rough game that was re-released or remade. It's a side-scroller, it's a 2D game for the most part. It's the roughest one of the trilogy. In terms of polish? Yeah, in terms of polish. So mm. the other ones that will follow here are Lorelei's the third one. The Cat Lady, the in-between. So Downfall, The Cat Lady, and Lorelei in that order. Okay. I did play The Cat Lady, uh, or a little bit of it at least, with you. And yeah. that was really impressive considering that it's made by basically one person, I think. Definitely good. They play great as a trilogy. It was definitely a good decision to remake Downfall from its crude original form. I think Downfall is the play and forget of the trilogy. It's probably less of an effective horror game than Bioshock. It is below Bioshock. Okay. The Cat Lady, I really liked. The story is very enjoyable. This is definitely a wood replay. And yeah, I did enjoy it more than Outlast. We have many proud entries in the 2D horror genre here. And Lorelei is even more polished. And I think it has to logically go next to... Which game would you say is more crude, Downfall or TierMaker.com tier list making software interface? Uh, TierMaker.com incorporated interface is more crude than Downfall and probably more crude than the original version of Downfall. Okay, so that doesn't sound too bad. Yeah. Next up is Visage. 3D, first person. I haven't played it yet. It's one of the games that emerged from the gap that PT left. Oh, I've heard about this. Yeah, sure. But it's more like taking the spiritual core of PT and building a complete game what, out of it. What is the spiritual core of PT? Walking down hallways? No, that would be the non-spiritual. Ah, the right, the okay. physical core of PT is walking down repeating hallways. But if a full studio would work on an actual full title that isn't just eight hours of hallway content, then that would be more what Visage probably is. It's definitely promising. It looks a bit try-hard from the outside. It's supposed to be a game that comes on pretty strong. Next is Among the Sleep. What do you know about Among the Sleep? You know, I've, I've heard the title before and thought to myself, there's already horror in the grammar of that title. Yeah, you mean among the sleeping, among the sleepers, among us sleepers. Among us sleepers, yeah. I looked into this once and I've watched part of a playthrough in a stream recently. With what I've played myself and with what I've seen in these streams, this is a lost me. It is promising, but I have no idea what it really wants to do. I think it's stylistically questionable. Okay, but what happens in the game? You play as a toddler that can barely walk. That's terrifying. And you have you have this little this little bear creature. Oh with god, you, that's who, terrifying. Who can talk? <laughs> who can who can talk like like a like a like a man? 
Um, <laughs> and you stumble through your house at night trying to find your mother, but then you're also carried away in a portal through to a forest kind of environment for a while. Um, okay. There's definitely some um, some hunting moments where you hunt for bears, yeah. you know, where, you, where you're hunted by a by a witch kind of creature. Okay, seems it seems very like mixed, like a lot of mixed ideas. It has good placement here with bad witch games. Bear witch game, and then Five Night at Freddy Bear. It's just the bear game section. This category now works like how much did the game lose me, mm -hmm. and Blair Witch does lose me more. At least I get what the, what the idea core is. mechanics are. Yeah. At least I finished Outlast 2. Funnily enough, I didn't finish Prey. <laughs> but I did odd. finish Outlast 2, so... Now, now it gets interesting. <laughs> now, finally, finally it gets interesting. With Inside, it's now time to discover your insides. Can you give us some insight? Side-scrolling adventure game by Playdead released maybe 2017 i don't know when it was released it still feels new little nightmares 1 was 2017 little nightmares 2 was 2021 yeah well a lot of people i think would say inside has legend status for some reason i think i think people get really excited about the art style and sort of the cinematicness of it so even though inside doesn't have as much interaction or levels of interaction than little nightmares it's often compared sibling series it still definitely has a lot of scary moments. It's a well-executed game overall, and it also has some strong horror moments. You played Inside as well. Yeah. If you remember the underwater segments. I remember it frequently, uh, sometimes in the middle of the night. For the submarine sections alone, it needs to be placed somewhere in the upper. Ah, this is, now it's really getting tough. I mean, we're not really debating for the highest levels, and I did not replay it Inside it's, yet. It's, it's short, and it's not that deep, you know? I would place it here. I think yeah. the Cat Lady and Lorelei have much more to give yeah. overall. And there are also longer games. Inside is not, not really that long. It's much shorter than all the Little Nightmares games as well. It is an amazing game, but Outlast is still slightly stronger overall. Outlast is a try-hard game. Inside is a very spectacle-heavy game as well. Mm -hmm. It has earned a, a high place. Yeah, definitely. Next is white day oh white day of course and from the cover this is a japanese horror game mm -hmm. that neither of us ever had any contact with fits just by this cover in the high school horror genre surprisingly we do have other games in the high school horror genre coming up so now we have a franchise next this next one is the first silent hill playstation 1 1999 it achieved the incredible feat of creating a sense of horror with three polygons. I did like it. it took me a long time to, to ever play it. It's clunky. It has terrible controls. It's very hard to get into it, but it is very well designed for its time. From all the older games, from all the 90s games, it is modern enough in its design to be played today. I didn't finish it, so it's... It's probably in Lost no, Me. No, you can't. You can't. Okay, now we have to have the fundamental discussion. If if we try to find the best horror game released in our lifetime, then we got to have a modern perspective. I don't we? I guess so. On the other hand, you literally made an entire YouTube channel and a video essay inspired by how much you were surprised by Silent Hill. So putting it in yes. Lost Me seems insane. There's a tier here called Recommendable, and you literally recommended it. You made a video recommending it. If this tier is called Would Replay, then what I mean is I would replay it right now. I would replay it oh. today. Not I would have replayed in the past. Of course, Play and Forget is a bit harsh and flawed. How could you not say Silent Hill is flawed? I have to commit at this point. Having played so many of these games, yeah. and I do have complete heartfelt admiration for these. Yes, I do think the original Silent Hill is flawed, and of course, it deserves its own legend status. That's just not my perspective of it. It annoys me in a similar way as replaying Resident Evil 4 annoys me. I'll give it the, the benefit of age to put it above Outlast 2 and to put it at the best flawed game on this list, <laughs> but it is definitely flawed and it has lost me, so how could I not put it in here? 
20 something years ago, Keiichiro Toyama said to himself, if 20 years in the future somebody sees my game as the best flawed game, <laughs> then my life's work will be complete. Except he said that in Japanese, of course. That, that would be ridiculous. Obviously. Okay, Silent Hill 2, I've played the very beginning and I just didn't get into it. It could have been that I just, you know, wasn't really in the overall mood for a game like this, but yeah, it lost me. <laughs> it probably didn't help that Silent Hill 1 lost me just before it. I could put it in did not play, giving it more benefit of the doubt that it's a well-made game underneath. Mm -hmm. And the exact same thing applies to red cover Silent Hill 3. So wherever 2 goes, 3 will follow. You did try to play it, right? Yeah. So they would logically have to go here. And I did like the opening of 3 more than 2, and I liked Heather as a character much more. Of course now people would say with especially the second one, I never even got to any of the parts that made Silent Hill 2 even better than the first one. And that is true. The addition that I make here is they did lose me, but for these I, I grant them that it, it was more my fault than theirs. Okay. So this is more a witness account than a rating. There probably is what would push them to maybe legend status inside, but I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, next one is Silent Hill The Room. We have a whole series of spin-offs coming up with Silent Hill as well, don't we? A whole lot of hills. They really know how to make these titles sound like there's just nothing going on. Like, like think about it, like a Silent Hill. Huh. <laughs> oh, there's a room now. Amazing. We would need a separate tier list of what is the best titled horror game. Is Five Nights at Freddy's a good <laughs> title? I think Blair Witch is a really good title. Yeah, there's actually a scary thing inside it. I quite like because, Bioshock as well. Yeah, Bioshock is, a, is an excellent title. Yeah. Five Nights at Freddy's as a title ranks higher than Five Nights at Freddy's as a game. People wouldn't really take offense <gasps> that it lost me more. <gasps> I can't do this. Uh. <laughs> Lost me, lost me much more than at least Outlast 2 did. Yeah. So we have now, weirdly, Outlast 2 placed between the Silent Hills. For me, they are trapped in, I love the premise, but I just can't connect to what they're doing. The first one, despite the lack of polygons, worked the best. So, to take some out of the harshness out of the Silent Hill rating, mm. I'm completely convinced that... I will love the remake that's coming out. The Silent Hill 2 remake. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, even if it is the exact same story with the exact same characters as Silent Hill 2 already had, I'm sure I will like it. The series as a whole ranks high, but these individual games as they were, they just don't do it for me. Next is the first Silent Hill game I ever played, Silent Hill Homecoming. Mm -hmm. Homecoming is still... <laughs> Still the worst horror game <laughs> of all the Silent Hills that I've played. So from what I've seen from 2 and 3, there was still more horror in these than Homecoming. Homecoming was just a, a weird action shooter. Somehow by the cover, I always imagined that you play the boy. Oh, that would have been a better game. Your main character doesn't really look like him either, but I guess this is supposed to be Josh, I think was his name. Hmm. So yeah, a uh, main character is pictured. Yeah, from these... There are different cover variations, but main character is pictured on all of these, and you could argue that the room is the main <laughs> character in the fourth one. There's there's probably a video essay about that out there, so... Wow. Yeah. It didn't lose you, Silent Hill Homecoming. No, this one is flawed. This one is deeply flawed, and this is the rating where Silent Hill fans would agree. The fact that you actually did spend enough hours to finish it is probably just one of its biggest flaws. It's not flawed in terms of how much I played. It's flawed because the hours I played, I didn't really play for horror. And I never even thought about replaying it. I never even thought about it, but I remember that the main character's name is Josh. Probably Josh Holloway, as I call him. Probably he isn't even called Josh Holloway. Next up! Silent Hill Origins. And now we're firmly entering territory where I have not played any of these. So this just goes here. I just found out that the guy's name is actually Alex Shepard. Who is Josh Holloway? Josh is the kid, Joshua Shepard. And Holloway is his mother, I think. His mother's first name is Holloway. No, his, his, I think he has a friend named Holloway. So all of these names are in the game, but they're not our main character's first or last name. 
All right. It's still impressive that you even had them in your head. <laughs> you just misattributed. It's a misreconstructed memory. Ah, okay, uh, okay. Next, Silent Hill Downpour. Some of these were Nintendo Wii exclusive games. Oh my god. Games. And there's nothing to say about Silent Hill Downpour. Now we're getting to the really interesting Silent Hill games with PT by Hideo Kojima, of course. This is a bit of an issue because at the time I don't think I had a PlayStation 4. I haven't personally played it, but for this one I would still rank it because I've seen it enough times. This is going up there and this is one I would replay if I've yeah. played it before. Yeah. I would play better than Dead Space 2. It's insane that uh, Teaser, which has a two-letter name and isn't downloadable anymore, is still known by pretty much everyone in the horror community. Yeah. Even I know about it and like know what it's about, and I don't, I've never played a horror game, as we've learned throughout this video. A few hours, almost only set in the same environment. Yeah. PT wasn't even released, and you can't even play it anymore. A weird entry that definitely left its mark. I think it's almost legendary just based on how much they did with how little the game really is. But then again, it's not even a full game. Yeah, okay, but they probably had a pretty big budget because yeah. if it ends with the Silent Hills teaser, then they had Silent Hill level budget for this one too. Because this was a teaser for players. This wasn't a teaser to prove to Konami that a new Silent Hill game could be made. Right. I'm going to pick a game out of order because it only makes sense to pick the game that we got instead of PT. And that is, of course, Death Stranding. If it was made differently, it could show you the horror of player-to-player -player communications. Mm. It actually pulled that off well enough that that isn't part of the horror. It could have been. Yeah. Let's try to compare this. So the horror part of Death Stranding is, of course, when something goes wrong, when you have contact with BTs, the beached things in, in the world. Oh my god, PT couldn't be realized, so he put BTs in Death Stranding. <laughs> what does it mean? Knowing Kojima personally, that's probably exactly what went on in his mind. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. With his overwhelming love for abbreviations. It was a more enjoyable game than Dead Space 2. It also had a, a really unique sense of horror. You have to maneuver through invisible enemies. I've played quite a bit of Death Stranding and there was a very special sort of dread to it, to the odd emptiness of everything and the, the sort of sad, collapsed society. More than one layer of horror. Yeah. It's a more complete game than PT. It's the best one in the recommendable friend Bao sits up here because it's it has more horror content than these. Okay. Personally, Death Stranding would be legend status, but not as a horror game. True. Next is Detention. Okay, another high school horror. Yeah, another high school horror entry. Does that woman have a knife in her head? Uh, looks like it, yeah. She doesn't appear to be bothered by the knife. Yeah, this is a did not play yet. But interesting. And we have its sibling, Devotion. It definitely has a haunting quality. Mm -hmm. Did not play. Now, if we want to talk about horror games, then how could you ever exclude a game literally titled Fear? Does it live up to its name? So you did play Fear and the... Expansions, the first expansion at least, you played Extraction Point, the shorter expansion. Yeah, uh, the, the thing about Fear that I don't think a lot of people know is that its uh, title is not just Fear, right? It's actually an acronym, which yes, uh, stands for Fire an Extreme Amount of Rounds. So if we're going to ask if it lives up to its title, yeah, as an action game, it totally does. But I was surprised to find that there were moments in it where it gets a little scary too. That's how it gets you. We have the interesting design decision here that you have shooty military burly guys mm -hmm. on the cover, but the fear element is much more prominent. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was an accidental match that Monolith got with this one. It wasn't coincidence that it turned out to be such a capable shooter, but it could have been an accident that the horror elements worked as well as they did. Yeah. And they hold up even on some replays, even though all of them are scripted. The yeah. part that, that scared me the most in Fear was the Invisiboys. So you did take horror from, from, from the, normal the combat, combat. Yeah, because there, there's yeah. these enemies that are invisible. So they generate emergent jump scares, basically, <laughs> which is terrifying. 
Yeah, without a doubt, fear is legend status. Oh. Me. Very competent enemy AI that it's known for. An excellent example of a game where you are fully armed, military level armed. More than that, you're almost like genetically enhanced. Superhumanly capable and armed. You're armed with legs. You're legged. <laughs> Only an excellent game. I would recommend it without any hesitation and I would replay it also without hesitation. So No, I agree. I agree. It also ranks higher than Fran Bauer <gasps> because we have to be fair <laughs> at this point. Yeah, so talking in terms of horror, and we are in horror action territory with these three, almost all of the playtime in Dead Space is horror playtime, and not all of the playtime in Fear is horror playtime. I see that, I see. Needless to say, all the playtime in Alien Isolation is pure horror playtime. Yeah, but so we don't have anything that could challenge Dead Space there? You mean yet, or overall? Or is there maybe a sequel to Fear that is even more competently made? <laughs> oh, right, okay, okay. The proper next entry, again, developed by Monolith, is Fear 2, Project Origin. I always really loved Fear 2. It's more polished in some ways, but less polished in others. It still has very strong AI. It tries much more visually this time. You can find video essays about how Fear 1 is always set in the most boring industrial buildings imaginable, <laughs> like a water treatment facility, and it still manages to be extremely engaging. But Fear 2, more interesting interiors, more varied locations. And I did like it even more in the first one. A very competent game. And one to rival Dead Space. Not quite above, but it does rival Dead Space. After such strong entries, we have F3 AR, mm -hmm. Year 3. Mm -hmm. And this one is worse than Dead Space 3. They just completely left their path. It fails harder in everything but the horror segments, but the horror segments still can't hold it up. And it has, like Dead Space 3, much more action focus, and it's all to its detriment. Just a good example for a game that was actually released, and that was horrible, but not because of bugs. Just because of choices. Just because of actual choices by the game designers. A different direction for Monolith Games, Condemned, Criminal Origins. Mm -hmm. I don't think many people really know this game or that there was another Condemned with Condemned 2 Bloodshot. Do we have the second one? I don't think we do because it's a console ah, exclusive. Okay. okay, okay, so yeah, the, uh, the prerequisite was to only include releases that also came out on PC. Yeah. Now we'd have to question if one of these Wii exclusives also released on PC, but who cares? Didn't play. Condemned? Amazing game. You play a police officer in a very dirty, crime-ridden city. Stumble around from place to place and try to solve this case. If a game like Fahrenheit tries to be a crime-solving game, mm -hmm. this one manages to keep up the crime-solving parts much longer mm -hmm. than Fahrenheit. Beyond the first level in the diner. Yeah. It's just go from place to place and experience whatever David Cage has in store for you. Condemned is different. It has detective mechanics that play a part and that the game even uses for horror purposes. Mm -hmm. It's very engaging and it even has some hefty melee combat. Condemned can sit next to Fear 1. Whoa, that's so high yeah. up. But there's not even any supernatural elements in Condemned, right? I didn't say that. Maybe it's... It's not as good as Friend Bao. It is legend status because it's such a surprise one really deserves its recognition. <laughs> Condemned. Criminal Oranges. Next, Afraid of Monsters. Director's Cut. A mod for Half-Life 1. So now we're leaving mainline game releases and head straight into mod territory because there are some, some very notable entries here. I wouldn't have included mods in this list if they weren't able to contend for these higher places. Mm -hmm they earned their way into this list. Afraid of Monsters was the first project by Team Six Galar, who later made Cry of Fear. It did lose me, <laughs> to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> so we're not starting on the most positive note. I think it gets a very strange placement between the Silent Hill games here. Really starting to doubt the Bioshock placement here. It seems so out of place. <laughs> Maybe Bioshock will be pushed down to not a horror game after all. Everything around Bioshock are actual horror games. Yeah, that's odd. We'll come back to that. 
from all the mods that we're going to talk about, Freight of Monsters has most of the clunkiness that you might expect from them. It's Gold Source engine, so a late 90s engine. I did try to play it two or three times. It has some very punishing puzzles, I think, which really makes this placement very fitting. Punishing and hard to understand puzzles is the hallmark of Silent Hill as a series. And clunky controls, so perfect placement. Couldn't be more <laughs> fitting, in fact. I thought you really liked that game. What I did really like is Cry of Fear, the most well-known project of Team Six Galar. Cry of Fear is definitely legend status. I think we only have two free games. One is not yet ranked. Cry of Fear started, I should probably say, as a mod for Gold Source. It looks much better than any Half-Life 1 mod. It's an amazing story set in Sweden. You wake up after a car crash and try to get your surroundings and find yourself in this distorted, twisted world. Very Silent Hill-esque. It's part of this category of horror games with a lot of combat. It's got a lot of suspense. Very strong entry. Very strong. A few design errors in this one. A few things that can really irritate you, but for the most part, really great game decisions in there. It's stronger than Condemned. Is it stronger than Fran Bao? It is stronger than Fran Bao. Yeah, uh, Fran Bao is the better story. Yeah. Craft here really has the, the foot on the pedal for the entire thing. Yeah, yeah. It's very intense. Deciding if Craft or Fear is the better game, despite having Fear all in the name and it should be sold from the beginning, <laughs> I really like the combat in Cry of Fear. Mm -hmm. Because the weapons really feel very impactful. You're in a strange situation where Fear has the better AI, so the better overall combat feeling. But Cry of Fear has the better weapons. One of the main reasons why Fear is even in Legend status for horror games is because it is a horror game and it is a game of Legend status. If we say the higher up we go, the more the game has to prove itself as a horror game, then Cry of Fear is higher than the Fear games. Because it's more of a horror game, yeah. Yeah, because it's much stronger. In terms of raw terror, Cry of Fear is stronger than Dead Space. <gasps> There's so much going into Cry of Fear. It has a great soundtrack, more relatable environments because it's just set in Stockholm. Simply put, if we would have to remember one thing about each of these games mm -hmm. with the top row, then Criminal Origins, I remember some particular jump scares in there mm -hmm. that really sold it for me because they were so well executed. Fran Bao has the pills yeah. that get you a jump scare each time. With Fear, I remember some horror segments, but most of what I remember is action. Yeah, it's true. And with Dead Space, I don't know. One or two had this regenerating enemy that was pretty scary. The argument, of course, that I want to make is, with Alien, I remember the alien, and I can remember every single moment with the alien, <laughs> and especially its first proper free-roaming appearance and San Cristobal, where it drops from the ceiling and you have to hide under this bed, and then you're just stuck with it for the rest of the game. So that's pretty easy to point out. Yeah. And Cry of Fear, everyone who ever played Cry of Fear remembers the remembers Chainsaw Man. The Chainsaw Man, yeah. I knew exactly what you were going to say, too. Cry of Fear, less polish, but more terror. Mm -hmm. And you could even say it uses some of its clunkiness as an amplifier for its terror that it puts you in. Definitely. So this would be a similarity to Silent Hill 1, where it uses the lack of control that you have over the character also to make you feel more claustrophobic and, and less in control. But it's not a contender for first place, huh? There's still more terror in Alien Isolation. And much more polish. I think it's true. With Cry of Fear, you remember the Chainsaw Man. I remember very distinctly the battle on the roof. I'm not saying that there aren't many parts to remember, but I say there is this one thing to point out that would make you feel afraid when you think, should I replay this? With Alien, I feel like I could actually recount the whole experience to you because it just happened. It's burned into my mind. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I mean. We always remember the parts that are most traumatizing and we remember the entirety of Alien Isolation. Maybe save for the intro, yeah, save for the opening. Next is Cryostasis. I'm pretty sure this was an Eastern European studio. Mm -hmm. I think this is a 2005, 2006 era kind of game. I liked many ideas from it. It's very sad. It's very cold. I think it has to go in Lost Me. I don't think I'll ever replay it less than I would ever try Silent Hill 2 or 3 in the originals. It's better than Homecoming. <laughs> More an atmospheric than a scary game. It's a good place. Between the point where Silent Hill skewed, mm -hmm. <laughs> where Silent Hill started to drop off, 
<laughs> lost me more. Lost yeah. me even more. The levels of lost. Next up, Doki Doki Literature Club. Oh my gosh. It's time. You're just going to hit us with this legend right in the middle? This is the pace breaker. But that looks like a fun, silly anime game for silly boys. Yep. This is the game on the list that I've played most recently. If we would have made this list a month ago, this would have been in Lost Me. Because my first playthrough, I just lost interest. It might almost be a not a horror game if you had rated it then. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> if we made this list a month ago, then I would have put it in maybe here because I, I knew nothing. But now, it's different. And now I would put it at least... <gasps> at, at least uh, above in the top of recommendable. Above the Strand game. When you approach DDSC on the Steam page, you have a certain assumption of what kind of game it would be. Then you see the tags and you see psychological horror and then you have a different kind of expectation about it. And I'm just going to add on this mystery and not say anything of substance about DDLC. And yes, DDSC is legend status. You can put, it, <laughs> put it up here now. <laughs> And now it's getting interesting. Oh um, my goodness. We can't really argue without spoiling a bunch. Yeah, we can't talk mechanically about DDLC. These are such intense recommendations that you can't afford to spoil it for anyone. So the top row, of course, means just play them yourself. Earlier we talked about what we remember from the games. <laughs> oh yeah, and you can remember a lot about this You can this remember... One. For me, it had one of the most intense gaming experiences I've ever had in a horror yeah. moment. It was maybe scarier than Condemned. This is getting very difficult. I think, yeah, it, okay, it goes above Renbao. And I'm yeah. sorry, Renbao, but no. you still are in legend status, so... I see that. And now, despite these being legend games, it is scarier than Fear. Now, is it better than Dead Space? <laughs> is Doki Doki Literature Club better than Dead Space? Let's leave it there for the moment. We might have to come back to it later. It's okay smiling at us between all these games between <laughs> fear 2 dead space and outlast this is where it belongs this is where it always wanted to be easier decisions to be made with dying light dying light of course a parkour zombie action game it's funny how with ddlc you can hardly find the words to do it justice but this is action zombie parkour game right here you might think that action and parkour really detract from the zombie horror, but for me personally, I'm very afraid of heights, so... I never once thought about that. I imagine that you would almost put this in not a horror game, but I would argue that with yep. the night cycle and the mandible creatures, there is definitely a certain horror component to the game. In terms of horror, the nighttime sections in Dying Light are the only ones worth talking about. I played this with friends on hard, and I know you would argue that if you're playing multiplayer, it's not even a horror game. But yep. I played on hard here and I never got caught by these mandible creatures once because it allows you so much mobility and so much speed. It's almost a non-challenge. By making you this powerful, the game designers were forced to also make these creatures very powerful. But then basically it's just an escape sequence. There's some scary sneaking around, but then most of the nighttime sections are entirely optional. This is like playing Minecraft with beds enabled, and yeah. you never even see any creatures. I think this just goes straight into the wow. end of the game. And this time I mean it with a judgmental face. And exactly the same, if not less, can be said about Dying Light 2, which is also not a horror game. Now, Little Nightmares. Tarsia Studios, very cute, but a horror game nonetheless. Very appealing. It is cute, but it's not easy. It's not a casual game. And some of the horror is more in movement controls than what you see on screen. I love it very much. This is this is a very popular game, and it didn't lose you, but it's not legendary, is it? Okay, so first, here we have an obvious discussion because Inside is the most similar game yeah. to Little Nightmares. Little Nightmares is much bigger, it just has more game to it. But on the other hand, Inside is way more polished and doesn't have all the frustrating little control issues and all those things. I don't necessarily see why it would rank higher. The order that I discovered Little Nightmares for myself was never played the first one, just saw a playthrough and started the second one, loved the second one so much that I went back to play the first one, then 
loved that one as well. Then returned to the second one and replayed it from the beginning oh my God. and loved that one as much as I thought I would. Yeah, I think Inside actually was better than the first Little Nightmares. You know what? It's just, it just isn't. Outlast always looks like a capable horror game, but it just is maybe 10%. Um, so Little Nightmares 2 then? Yeah, Little Nightmares 2, at least here. Definitely. It's overall an improvement on Little Nightmares 1, except for maybe the hat design. Yeah, clothing choice is much worse than Little Nightmares 1, yet that's probably why Tarzir decided to make it an option. I actually have no idea what they thought about this. And even less than that, I don't know why they chose the paper bag hat as the poster, as the default. No idea. That's so This silly. just is, this paper bag hat is the single worst decision made in the entire development time frame of the Little Nightmares series. You know how, how things are with defaults. Most people don't change the defaults. So not only is this the appearance of the literal poster boy, it's also the hat that you wear throughout the entirety of the game if you never change it. I don't think that's quite possible, but if you never find any of the other hats, because they are unlockables, they're not just a setting. The paperback hat, yeah, I go as far. The paperback hat of Mono is a worse decision than the pool level was <laughs> in Secrets of the Mall. Maybe insert a clip of the pool level here. Perfect. Maybe reconsider some of the controversial choices. For one, I would actually move Bioshock out. It just feels like it's in the wrong place. Yeah, yeah. Maybe quick consideration about the Silent Hill games. Now, without Bioshock in the vicinity, I think this is okay. For all the hardcore Silent Hill fans out there, as I said, it is more lost me than flawed. I've been thinking about this last night and, and this morning. There can be a lot of things that put you off playing Silent Hill as a newcomer approaching the series today. The controls, mm, yeah. maybe the graphics, the voice acting. It's just much more endearing if you've grown up with it. All of which I'm sure are going to be addressed with the, the remake. Yeah, no, that makes sense. It feels like Flawed and Lost Me is actually more positive than Play and Forget. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that's true. I mean, it depends. Do you, do you just want a game to make an impression? The issue here is that they were both flawed, but yeah. for different reasons. Yeah. And this is not even the category for flawed. Yeah. So you would move the them to flawed slash lost me then? Yeah, because Darkwood did lose me. It probably lost me less than these two. <laughs> Okay. So it lost me less than Silent Hill 2, but it lost me more than Afraid of Monsters. So in terms of playtime, this would now be an accurate representation. With the exception of Outlast 2, which I completed. And Downfall I did finish, and I would recommend it, <laughs> but it's the least polished. You could put it on the very end of recommendable. So are you saying that you would kick out the decent tier? Not yet, not yet. But I don't yet know if we have games that are just not memorable. I'm not sure if we have these. I guess if I would have liked Five Nights at Freddy more, it would have been in here. Maybe Prey is a good candidate for here. But Prey as a horror game is flawed. <laughs> so it goes back down here. We'll see how it goes. Maybe this file will be deleted later on. So next is Slender the Eight Pages. The original, was it an itch.io release? Or was it even before itch.io was around? It was definitely more of a like demo, right? It was something you could download as a zip file, but it was post Newgrounds. It wasn't just a flash game you would play in your browser. I think everyone knows what Slender was about. You're in a very low budget forest at night <laughs> and you're asked to collect a number of pages. And the more pages you collect, the more hunted you are by the Slenderman. Popular meme figure Slenderman which was then later chosen to be depicted as well on the cover of the sequel or the remake. And you can't look at him, right? That's the that's the thing. If you look at him, yeah. he gets you. Very gimmick driven. Yeah, a monster you can't look at. You don't lose if you look at him too much. You lose when he gets you. So it's not exactly the same kind of, it's, it's, not, it's not, not the most consistent mechanic there. Yeah, I remember it was like a party game for us then. Mm -hmm. We like had a bunch of friends over and we were like, okay, we're gonna play this game. But it always ended up with us playing for five minutes and then 
whoever was playing would be like, I can't do this, somebody else has to play, and then nobody <laughs> else would volunteer. <laughs> and then that was the end of that. With what it wants to do, it is reasonably successful, I think. Yeah, you know what? This is the perfect example of a play and forget. Hmm. It's short, it doesn't want to do that much. It's kind of a meme game because mm -hmm. Cinnamon existed as a web series. Really? Yeah, the uh, Marble Hornets series is, I think, where Slenderman came from. Slenderman is the Blair Witch of a different generation. The sequel, I don't think it deserves as much praise. I would even say it's flawed just because it's a sequel. What does it do? I mean, what, what more does it do? It's just a more detailed level? It tries to do some plot development that worked better in a web series that doesn't really have to talk to you that much. And it has characters in a story where you don't really need characters. The horror doesn't really work through the personal story. The personal story is more of a victim to it. Yeah, I would say it's worse than FNAF. Maybe just because it's less competent, it's also worse than Blair Witch. Mm -hmm. But it's still better than Fear 3. The Police Unreleased is currently reserved apparently for action games. Now, this next one is, is a really interesting one. This tier list really distinguishes itself by also having mods and games that evolve from mods, which you don't usually see in these kind of lists. Because the next one is Underhell. Oh god. Underhell is a mod for Half-Life 2 for the modern Source engine. Originally released in 2011, a much bigger project than you would expect. Led by someone who later joined New World Interactive, the mod team was called We Create Stuff. It starts off with some action, some mystery, a story of a deceased wife, and you begin in the house that looks a bit like the house on the cover, but it's not actually that dark or foreboding. And then you learn of your police, military backstory. It's very free form. It's excellent. It's another one of these secret successes of the list. Just the house that acts as a sort of hub world at the start of the game isn't even meant to be that scary, but somehow I managed to not adhere to the tutorial messages. At some point, there was some jump scare that forces you to go to bed. Yeah. It has a hub world with your home that also has a very source engine day-night cycle, like you would see in Gary's mod. Yeah, yeah. And there are dreams that you can go through, like the tutorial was baked into dream sequences. There are a hundred things that make Underhell unexpectedly special. It's completely different to most things I've ever played. The only thing it could really compare to is Cry of Fear. It also has a very noteworthy soundtrack. Not only was I surprised at the sudden horror elements in this otherwise peaceful hub world, I was also surprised at how deep and like complex the writing and the story was. There are these extensive cutscenes with so much character building and plot. And then the whole game presents itself to you as Underhell Chapter 1, and you're like, good lord. <laughs> It's got a lot of suspense because you really never know where it's going, but yeah. it's very dense in its content. It's very unpredictable, it has a lot of amazing gameplay as well. It does have a lot of combat, more of a scary, extremely enjoyable atmosphere, and boss fights. Very weird game, it may be industrial, like Silent Hill set in a prison with a lot more characters than any Silent Hill game would ever serve you. Without a doubt, it's legend status. It has less horror than most of these. I would deduct some points there for the clunkiness of the enemies are usually implemented. That took away much from the scariness that somehow still worked for you. I think just because of polish, I can't really put it above Condemned. It shines for the kind of budget it was made in. These two really shake hands. Yeah, yeah, this is a good placement. Underhill, legend status. Now, we are off to... Supermassive games with Until Dawn, uh. PlayStation 4 exclusive. And I think even today, even with The Quarry now being released on Steam, Until Dawn is still PlayStation exclusive. So yeah, Until Dawn is more of an interactive movie than a game, and not necessarily in a positive sense. It can drag. It's not a constant thrill ride, maybe the second half more than the first. And it has a bunch of those gimmicks in there, like don't move your controller or don't but make I, too much I really noise. love these kind of things, you know. I, <laughs> I'm all for binding games to specific platforms so you can pull off all the gimmicks that the platform can offer or the, the yeah. DualShock can offer. 
the don't move or the hold your breath minigame returns in the quarry, but because it's now a cross-platform game, it's just hold X oh, really? for a specific time. But I still managed to fail three out of four, according to the Steam achievements, because I didn't know that you also have to let go before the meter runs out. So the meter is just your breath meter. It's not actually how long you have to hold the buttons. Oh. <laughs> These have an obvious platform to be directly compared, and I did enjoy the quarry much more. I also thought it was actually harder to save all your characters. It worked much better, I think, in building likable characters that you want to make it through the night. I mean, it is a slasher, like the first one. A slasher with supernatural misdirection. I think, yeah, Until Dawn, it just loses too much of its appeal on your second playthrough because there's not too much interaction in it if you've just seen it once. That's also enough to destroy most of the fun playing it, so maybe it's more of a play and forget. Yeah, I see that. These games are meant to be built on replayability, but there's just not that much difference between your first and second playthrough. Or is it built on revelations that don't work in the second playthrough? Mm. These kind of games could have the problem that your decisions don't really make much of a difference, so it plays out the same. But Until Dawn is more that it takes too long to get to its decisions. If you replay it, there's just a lot of watching the same kind of events because mm -hmm. they are just the padding of the story and it, it really takes a lot of time. It's frustrating. It is flawed. It did not lose me. It is better than Slender, of course. I would not replay it, and if I were to recommend a game, I would now recommend The Quarry, mm -hmm. and not this one. So The Quarry would be at least here. I think The Quarry is a definite recommendation, and I would replay it, I have to replay it. I think these two can shake hands now, here. It's not above Outlast. We have to take some appreciative words for Outlast. It's really good. It could have oh, used great. more, also more content in the same way as Until Dawn did, but it's a solid entry. What you see here are quick time events, or QTEs, which will help you to act at just the right time. Watch your step. Parker's Quarry can be a dangerous place if you're not paying attention to your surroundings. Take your eye off the ball, and it could spell disaster. <laughs> now I'm thinking, is Lorelei actually better than Little Nightmares 2? You can adjust that, sure. Let's shuffle these here because there is a big difference between Nightmares 2 and 1. Mm. Also, 1 includes the DLC, which works more to its detriment. Hmm. Not quite, it's not that bad. It's not exactly a plus, either. Yeah, and inside, let's put it like this for now. Those were our two supermassive games. Now this is going to be a bit difficult because we now have old... Resident Evil releases. Mm. I don't know anything about the first Resident Evil. I've never played it. Yeah, it looks like an Evil Dead poster or something. It looks very traditional. Are these spiders? I don't know. I always mix up the first Resident Evil with the first Alone in the Dark, because it was the first Alone in the Dark that really established the survival horror genre. But I think Resident Evil 2 is what then really committed afterwards. One is did not play. Resident Evil 2? Did not play either. I did play the remake, and we're going to get to that. Resident Evil always seemed very action-y to me, like an action game with a little bit of horror ideas. Yeah, it suffered from a decline into action-oriented gameplay. Mm -hmm. 4 was the last that could pull it off. 5 and 6 were a disaster. I'm spoiling the decisions here, but I don't think there are many fans of 5 and 6 out there. And then, of course, 7 returned to... Did 7, if people said 7 was a return to form, does that mean the first game was a first-person game? That would be pretty weird for the time. Resident Evil 3, that's the Nemesis one, did not play. Mm -hmm. Understandable. Resident Evil 4, I did play. So this would be the earliest released Resident Evil game that I played personally. Universally loved. Mm -hmm. I don't quite love it. It is pretty good, but it's also painfully clunky. On my bad days, I would say it's as clunky as Deadly Premonition. It's kind of blasphemic, actually. And I think mainly because you can't move and shoot at the same time, which is a very Deadly Premonition kind of thing. Oh my to do. god, really? I think it has a terrible control scheme, not unusual for the time. It's a third person action, light horror elements. Your character, Leon, is especially unlikable, and he's there to rescue the president's daughter. So we're on the right. highest echelon in terms of writing. I did enjoy it. I wouldn't recommend it, but I, I fully understand why other people recommend it. So I think I'll give it a fair placement in Play and Forget. 
Resident Evil 5. The continuation of the decline into action. I think I played Resident Evil 5. I don't remember anything about it. With Resident Evil, we can't really go with the Bioshock excuse because these are supposed to be horror games. So their focus on action would also be seen as a negative from the fan side. So it's not just, oh, they made Bioshock 1 and then they made Infinite, which wasn't a horror game anymore. To me, to me, it was pretty abysmal. I think I played it to the end, just fell into my, my Steam library and then there it was. Resident Evil 4, I have a very good idea of what it's about. I even knew the thing about the president's daughter. But I remember even then thinking, wait a minute, we're up to six? Was there even a fifth one? If I show you a screenshot of Resident Evil 5, you will, you will probably recognize it and then immediately confirm the police unrelease rating. <laughs> okay. Because I suddenly remembered the entire game. Oh, is it the one in Africa? Yeah. Oh. oh, I just remembered. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Earned its place. It's worse than for 3 -er. Resident Evil 5 doesn't really have anything to offer there. And Dead Space 3 is just an, an empty shell of a weird space action game. And these are all co-op games. All hmm. of these have received co-op options where their predecessors didn't have co-op. All right. Resident Evil 6, then. In my mind, about as bad as the fifth one. I would have to look at another screenshot to maybe remember anything. Oh yeah, okay, I did play this, I did play this. Even less memorable, even less horror, it's, it doesn't really matter. We can put them in numerical order. So Fear 3 is officially the least bad, please unrelease. All right, and now suddenly we return to form a game called Resident Evil. First person, very confined settings, highly detailed set pieces, nice and slow pacing, some good horror still, tiny bit of action in there. You're definitely armed, it's not quite an amnesia yet. And the enemies yeah. are kind of bullet spongy, you know? Yeah, if you say mushrooms are also a sort of sponge, then they are literal sponges. So I like it for the more realistic setting. Much of the story is something that could happen to, to someone just like that and then it gets its paranormal spin, which turns out to be more of a created in a lab kind of thing. Did you play the demo? I played the demo for about an hour and a half and was fully stumped by the, the little puzzle that was in it. I played it for about an hour and a half and didn't actually <laughs> find the content. <laughs> You know, what makes it even better is that I recorded this as a Let's Play. Seven hour Let's Play of it's, the demo. It's of, really of, just nothing happens for an hour and a half, and I'm just trying to figure out what is going on. The demo was literally called Resident Evil 7 Beginning Hour. Yeah, so okay. In terms of placement, it's more than play and forget. It is a recommendation. It has a strange second half, which seems to be a theme for the modern Resident Evil games. The last 30% have to take place in an entirely different place with a different feeling. I think I liked it more than Dead Space 2. And it's also more polished than Outlast. It's not exactly legend status. It's very linear in the end. It has typical Resident Evil puzzles that are a bit point and click theme. And it's not quite a PT. Okay, this, we're changing the list order because the remakes don't make sense. I'm going in order of release. So next is the modern remake of Resident Evil 2. So this sits close to this one. It's very similar in design. It's now third person again. I'm not sure if I liked it more, but it definitely was more scary. Because okay. Resident Evil 2 has Mr. X, and Mr. X is the closest thing that we have to the alien. Oh my god, okay. So it comes down to uh, how effective is Mr. X compared to the alien? How scary is the rest of the game? What's the environment that we're running away from Mr. X and try to not get found? And I think this is where it falls flat a bit. The replayability of Alien Isolation is extreme, even if it is a very long game and it has its more linear segments. But I would have replayed it already if they released the VR mode cross-platform. It is stronger than PT. Mm. It's also stronger than the first of the nightmares. And we now have another entry that works with terror. Mm -hmm. It also surpasses our 2D entries here. This now gets tougher because with the hospital sections in Nightmares 2, I think they can really put up a fight. The negative that I constantly have in mind here is what you do while you're hunted by Mr. X. It's just a bit disappointing. I think it needs to stay here. 
I'm no longer so sure with Death Stranding. It's not the same kind of terror. Most of Death Stranding is traversing the landscape, mm. not being afraid. Which now makes Little Nightmares 2 the first place in the recommendable tier. A quick excursion, Resident Evil 3, the remake, less liked, less admired than the remake for Resident Evil 2. I did not yet play this, even though I was enough in the mood for a Resident Evil game to replay Village. From what I've heard, Resident Evil 3 being a bit too short, or that they cut out many of the interesting sections of the original, mm -hmm. I just didn't want to start a short game like this. And of course, during release, it was also very expensive for the length. So I skipped this one. Exactly the same as Resident Evil 2 with a different main character and slightly different locations. <laughs> now we have an order of release, 5, 6, 7, 2, 3, 8. Of course. Okay, Resident Evil Village, I haven't yet finished. It's comparably recent. I liked a lot about Village's design, but not so much about its gameplay. I think it is a bit dull. You have some moments where you're hunted. The first location you get to after the eponymous village is Castle Dimitrescu, where you have not only Lady Dimitrescu, but also the three vampire daughters mm -hmm. of her. Again, with the Resident Evil formula, first supernatural, later turned lab created, or at least supernatural things you can still analyze in a lab. Okay. <laughs> I liked the departure with the more wacky monster designs. I like that much more. But the things you fight are still the exact same, very simple kind of things that you already had in Seven. They just aren't fun to fight. So how enjoyable the fighting is, I think, plays a role here. The puzzles are, again, point-and-click kind of puzzles. And there are only some sections that really have this terror of being hunted. And it's not the same kind of active hunting, either. It appears, first, that you're now hunted by Lady Dimitrescu throughout the house, where you hear her walking around and ducking to go through her... The doors in her own house that were built too small for her to go through. Mm -hmm. It's not like in the remake of Resident Evil 2, where you constantly hear him stomping around for hours. Mm. And you really have to worry about where he's going and plan your little routes throughout the police station. Like, mm. look at the map and see where you could maybe take a different route to the same room. They just don't get there here. Mm. And even worse, if you play it on anything else than the default difficulty, it's just bullet sponge enemies. Just really frustrating. I would recommend it just out of style, not because it's an excellent game. So, so it's actually a more padded out, less focused extension to Resident Evil 7. It's not padded. There are things happening, but much of it is, is cutscene stuff. It's not difficult to get through it. It's not frustrating because mm. the dialogue is just frustrating because you, you hope that things are now happening. I think it has an identity crisis, to be honest. But you're still recommending it. Yeah, I'm not sure yet about the placement. It probably sits somewhere near until dawn, to be honest. It is decent. It's not plain forget, but it's decent. I mean, you'll never forget Lady Dimitrescu, but other than that... I will remember the the character design. I won't remember gameplay. Mm, yeah. It's not burned in the same way as the reveal of Mr. X the first time you see him. Or many of the elements, including story, including puzzles even, of Little Nightmares 2. It pains me a bit, because Village is extremely promising and it, it looks very charming too. It seems shallow even though the characters really aren't. Your enemies aren't. Your own character is extremely <laughs> shallow. Your <laughs> own character couldn't be more boring. Yeah, Village has all the charm, but Cry of Fear has all the gameplay. <laughs> what you actually do is much more interesting in every game in this top row. Alan Wake, Remedy Entertainment. This is a Microsoft Game Studios game. Alan Wake borders on not even being a horror game, I think. It has an intriguing hook where you go on vacation with your wife as a writer and the island that you're staying on just completely disappears. And he wakes up in a crashed car and then tries to piece together what happened. It is built on mechanics at its core. You have to shine a light on your monsters to make them vulnerable to bullets. And that's what you do. Definitely lacks variation. Alan Wake is a really approachable horror game. Yeah, I think it's a gateway game for a lot of people. It plays a respectable role in that sense. This one, 
good example for slightly... Yeah. It has more to give than Slender, and That's it's a perfect <laughs> plane for get. It's a very normal game. <laughs> Especially as a horror game. Like, you... Yeah. When you're thinking about horror games, Alan Wake is certainly not the first thing that you would think of. You'd have to dig a bit deeper to even find it in your game mm -hmm. library. Mm -hmm. That you've sorted by the exact order of this tier list. Of course. Which is not, not very far, as we see, but... <laughs> yeah. It wouldn't be your first choice, it wouldn't be your tenth choice. If you go far enough, then sometime later it will be your choice. Better and Slender, not quite, not quite as much as Until Dawn. I think it has less jump scares than Until Dawn. If that's a plus, then yeah. Weird entry next with the first System Shock. Do you know a lot about the first System Shock? Um, no. All right. Then we're on the same page because did not play. <laughs> you know, I did play the demo for the new remake uh, at Gamescom, and it was, in a word, unremarkable. There was not a single moment in there that I hadn't already seen many times before. Yeah, probably because it's the original ancestor of most. All the immersive sim sort of. Yeah. Games, yeah. So that that's that would obviously be the issue with the first Resident Evil, the original Silent Hill. These yeah. are grandfathers to probably all of these games. I mean, that's the... I just wanted to say, if we talk about System Shock 2 next, it is, of course, better than decent. But to me, it's still flawed. I would like to establish there's a reason I didn't just put S rank, A rank, B rank here. Of course, Legend status is a bit better than just would replay. But these two are our middle row side by side. Flawed Lost Me means exactly what it says. It means there is an issue with this game, and the game would be better without this issue. It doesn't fulfill its potential. Yeah. And for System Shock 2, this would weirdly be first place issue that I had is motion sickness. I had less motion sickness playing VR games. So System Shock 2, back to staging, back to staging you go. System Shock 2 is the first game by Irrational Games, the later creators of Bioshock. Still alive and still very playable to date. I probably gave it three attempts to get into it, and mm -hmm. one of the three I played pretty far. And if you've played Bioshock, it just feels like an older prototype kind of version. Of course, if I say the less flawed version of System Shock 2 is Bioshock, and Bioshock is not even a horror game. Mm -hmm. So maybe this also should get a free pass. I think I've heard people talk about System Shock 2 being scarier than Bioshock, but I don't think it's generally perceived as a horror horror game. It does have its scary moments, but it has them the exact same way as Bioshock has them. Yeah. Now back to real horror games with Penumbra Overture. Chronologically accurate, we're now moving through the catalog of frictional games. The first mainline game. This is the formula that would later evolve into Amnesia The Dark Descent, mm -hmm. a recognized masterpiece. I played all the Penumbra games. I played them after Amnesia Dark Descent. Very strong. They are much more philosophical than Amnesia was, and that one always liked its philosophical um, underbelly. It's got to be at least so recommendable, right? It does have its clunkiness. Okay, I'm going to put it above Outlast because it manages to be more subtle in everything that it tries to do. <laughs> It doesn't have too many scripted chase sequences, which Outlast, of course, loves as a series. I wouldn't place it above Resident Evil 7 because here we're now going into high polish territory. Mm -hmm. It's the first one. It has some solid puzzles, as far as I remember, and I would replay it. And now we're just going to move through the Penumbra list. So we have Black Plague. I am just going to take the easy route with, with the Penumbra games because I'm just going to put them side by side. It makes sense. They're all very similar, right? As far as I remember, Black Plague is the longest one. Going by shadowy memory, I'm going to say Black Plague, more of a complete experience than Overture, and Requiem as the last one, which I think is actually just a Requiem. I remember one of the three was very short. These games all came out during the golden era of video games in 2007, 2008. Yeah. So they must have been, Friction must have been already working on Amnesia by the time Requiem came out, but this is all just guessing. Now back to Japanese games with Fatal Frame, which I did not play. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Maybe open an own tier for Japanese games, because they all landed did not play anyway. 
Yeah, unknown did not play unknown Japanese game. Yeah. I love how all of them are also high school horrors. Yeah, it's another high school horror. We should group the high school horror games together. There you go. Some of the Silent Hill games are also high school games. And then how about Fatal Frame 2? Did you play that at least? Fatal Frame 2? I also did not play. Great. Well, that's good. That's good to have it on the list. The only thing I know about the Fatal Frame games is that you're armed with just a camera. You definitely don't fight back. But if you take photos at the right time of ghosts, then you can push them back or, you know, make them retreat for a bit. It's alien isolation with a camera instead of a flamethrower. So potentially legend status. I couldn't say it this time. And now it's time to sour the mood a bit with Bloober Team Layers of Fear. That looks scary. They are. <laughs> Does it's it? scary enough that I wouldn't play it. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming it's probably very scary, so I don't know, recommendable? Maybe legend status? It also has fear in the name, which is established as granting you instant legend status. Games with fear in the name, are they all in They are legend status? They absolutely Do are. Do we have any exceptions to this one? This is, a, this is the secret tip for all- Any exceptions to this well, one? Well, that doesn't say fear, it says for 3R. Yeah, okay. So this is this is the secret tip. Put fear in the name and you get legend status, right? Right. This is the game that really established the Bloober Team formula of look this way, look the other way, something scary happens, horror on rails. It's like a dark ride. I haven't played it yet, but I would probably put it in at least flawed, lost me or abysmal by what I think of Bloober Team games. It would be sitting next to Blair Witch, but I can't yet put it next to Blair Witch because I haven't played it. But you are already very, very biased against it. Exactly. And the same thing applies to Layers of Fear 2. These kind of dark rides where everything just happens to you, but you're not really a part of it, you're just a witness, it just doesn't grip me at all. Sounds like the next Bloober Team game has a very fitting title then, because it's just Observer. Uh, yeah. Observer is one of the few Bloober Team games that I did look into. It completely lost me very early on, and I think it loses me harder than Slender the Arrival. Bloober Team games, it feels like while you're playing, someone's always ripping at your sleeve. You're in this slightly scary environment, but if you even try to engage with it, someone wants to drag you somewhere to show you something. Mm-hmm. But then what they're showing you is, is really boring. So it's, it's always a disappointment. <laughs> You're dragged by the sleeve from disappointment to disappointment. That's exactly also what Outlast 2 does, but it's more competent in dragging you around, but that's not what I get from Bloober Team games. Now for the less likely entries here, we have The Last of Us. The Last of Us invites us to ask again, is this a horror game? Well, didn't you also play this? I did. I, I was thinking of this earlier when you were talking about another game that had deliberately clunky controls. The sense of being a little bit powerless. And the claustrophobia of, of not being able to look around properly and react in time. Exactly, exactly. Which is also a big component in Alien of when you're like solving a puzzle or saving your game and the alien might be running up behind you right that moment. And that is very effective to me in The Last of Us. But it's also so story heavy and accessible in a world building sense that it doesn't feel like an explicit horror game. I think it definitely does scare you. It has terror when you're around a mix of zombies and clickers. It is intense. They have an amazing foundation to build anything scary on top. Yeah, The Last of Us can only go in two places. It's either legend status or it's not a horror game. I would go the other direction this time than I went with Bioshock 1 and, and actually put this in legend status. I think I'm with you. It's interesting that they chose to remaster the game in black and white. That was a courageous decision. Yeah, really? Naughty Dog are known for their courageous decision in game design. If you just ignore that they also made Uncharted, but... Famous grappling hook game Uncharted. Famous weird action platformer. Famous gender swap Lara Croft. Famous optional fat phobia DLC game Uncharted. <laughs> When was that? Was that the there's just, most there's like a one? DLC where you can turn all the characters into morbidly ah, obese okay. characters. Okay. And most controversial on this list, but for different reasons and not the reasons I am interested in here at all, The Last of Us Part 2, the sequel to The Last of Us Part 1. 
The Last of Us is such a vast game, or both of the parts are such vast games that you, you live through so much in these games that you could question in the end how much of that was horror. But if I remember, especially here, many of the segments of part two, then how could I say that that wasn't good horror? Yeah. So of course, part two, for me, goes Above even part one, wow. Above part one, without a doubt. If we want to nitpick, we can put remastered above the non-remastered yeah. first one. If there's these are these are stand-ins for the yet to be released part one remake that's not yet on PC. Now we have to find a good placement in legend status. How often does it scare you? What's the terror that you feel? How hunted do you feel? What is mm -hmm. the enemy mm -hmm. design? How dark or how foreboding are the environments? And it is strong in all of these in all of these categories. Yeah, agreed. If we let part two take the lead, it is stronger than Underhill. Oh, easily, it yeah. Strange. It is stronger than Condemned. It's <laughs> it's the least clunky game that I've ever played. It has a lot of accessibility options that even without using them, it's already as polished as a game could possibly be, mm -hmm. I think. It is stronger than Brainbow. It is stronger than Fear and Fear 2. I see that. I'll pull the others. Yeah, go ahead. Now the question is, does it carry its horror out of its isolated universe, drive it deep into your heart, twist it, and then pull you into the game with it, the way that Doki Doki does? My answer is yes. Wow. Let's say The Last of Us Part Two has multiple acts, and the way that it splits them lets you have a lot of time to really contemplate what you did or what happened, and that made it extremely effective. So yes, The Last of Us Part Two is even more intense than Doki Doki Literature Club. Impressive. And yes, it is even stronger than Dead Space. The others don't. This is the dividing line. <laughs> there's, yeah. there, there's an, there's an unbreakable barrier between Last of Us Part One and Two, made entirely of Doki Doki Literature Club and Dead Space. <laughs> <laughs> this cannot, this cannot be broken. Now it becomes even harder, and I should emphasize: is the horror part of the Last of Us Part Two strong enough to subvert the strength, the raw strength and terror of Cry of Fear? You really need to put, like, tense music under this part. <laughs> I just put the Doki Doki soundtrack. How could a soundtrack be more intense? <laughs> and then a remix of the Doki Doki and the Dead Space soundtrack. <laughs> the Last of Us Part Two is an incredibly made game, but just in terms of evoking horror in the player, not many things are as effective as the sheer low-poly crudeness of Cry of Fear. I have to say, though, you didn't play The Last of Us Part no, 2 I, yet. No, I didn't. I didn't play it yet, but I, I just can't imagine The Last of Us formula breaking through Cry of Fear. You're building this all on the strength that you know from Cry of Fear. Yeah, correct. The more I think about it, this is our new contender Oh my goodness. Alien Isolation. I really did not expect that. I don't think it can overpower Alien Isolation. Alien Isolation that wants nothing more then terrorize you throughout mm. the entire playtime mm. if you remove the first like two hours. This is the placement. So they have a divide of three games between them. So a quick reshuffling with oh, we're doing Bioshock. Again? Oh, we're doing Bioshock again. Yeah, we're doing Bioshock a third time, a third reconsideration. This was all planned to keep you on your toes, the viewers on their toes. So in our hearts, in our heart of hearts, we can all agree that Bioshock 1 is a kind of horror game. It is built to be scary in the beginning. It has explicit jump scares even, or yeah. scenes that build up like Bloober Team scenes. But it works out pretty well, and yes, Bioshock 1 needs to go somewhere else. We all agree that Bioshock Infinite went in a different direction. So you want to move Bioshock back into the list and keep Infinite out of it? Yes, and I think because it is most similar to Dead Space 2. Maybe it's slightly less than the quarry, but that's a good position. And it's tougher with Bioshock 2, which was 
very similar, but... You don't think that's a... I was assuming you would say that's a clear-cut case of play and forget. Yeah, if we take the other games, it's it's less than Resident Evil 4, for sure, even with the clunkiness. And it is less than Village. Village always, to me, is surprisingly weak. It's not fun or effective as a horror game, it's just well decorated. And Until Dawn was still slightly better, so... <laughs> and I think <laughs> and Alan Wake was also slightly better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Wake wasn't bad. It just wasn't too much of a horror game. I played Bioshock 2 once, but I did play and forget, literally. Bioshock back in the mix. Oh, System Shock is coming back too? I see your mouse hovering. Yeah, <laughs> I'm considering. It is less than Alan Wake, though. System Shock 2, tough to get into. It is very old. Genre-defining or not, the thing it defined was more immersive sim than horror mm, games. So. This is true. You can play System Shock 2 and forget that it's a horror game. You would not remember it as a horror game. And maybe what people liked about Resident Evil 4 is more that it was a capable action game if you can get over the controls, Yeah. but not saying too much towards its stance as something to, to frighten you. Okay, next proper entry, Oxenfree. Oh my god. I'm not sure if so many people really know Oxenfree. As no, no, you a, have to pitch it. Oxenfree is a dialogue-driven, side-scrolling horror adventure mystery where you play a young woman on a, a retreat with your friends with a dark mystery in the air. I really love the dialogue system, but that has nothing to do with horror. It, it doesn't want to be that much of a horror game. It also has a very um, strong story, very character-driven story as well. There's a lot you're anticipating to happen, and it has some sudden scares. It's more of a suffocating to happen, and it has some sudden suffocating to happen, and it has some sudden. Mm. It's more of a subtle dread yeah. sort of game. So Oxen Free is at least near here, where we would have a definitely stronger in terms of horror than many of these here. The horror in Oxen Free is, is a surprise, but because it happens quite early, where it takes this divergent into being much more scary and distorted and unexpected, like places some, some unexpected surprises for you. It manages to maintain this through the entire thing. So it is stronger than all of these and it I never forgot it. I always wanted to replay it in fact, so we're at least here. It is stronger than Downfall. The horror it has is stronger than the horror Bioshock has, I think, because it, yeah. it does more with it. It's more consistent. It doesn't need to spend the rest of the budget on action and also giving you a grenade launcher. Maybe it's stronger than the quarry because of the dialogue, but the quarry is so high budget. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's a good placement. Now more gore with The Evil Within. Ah. Despite the cover, this isn't uh, Tripwire Interactive. This is <laughs> Tango Gameworks. Terrible at launch. It had forced letterboxing. It wanted to be a movie more than anything else. A gory, dark detective slasher movie. Evil Within, I hated when I first played it. My personal contact with Evil Within started with extreme frustration and hating it so much. I think I, I was definitely close to breaking at least one controller with this one. It's a very unique survival horror game where you're heavily armed very unique, solid, solid story, very dreamy, very ambitious. The thing is, it is flawed. I'm not sure if I would recommend it. <laughs> I enjoyed it, but I'm not sure if I would recommend it. It's like a cursed game. When I last replayed it, the boss fights were much easier, but the end dragged on for hours. Mm -hmm. I had to really force myself to, to finish it that time. And this is something not even Resident Evil 4 is is that frustrating, and this is definitely a frustrating game. But then you played The Evil Within 2. Okay, yeah, different story with that one. because This one I liked much more when it came out. This one I would recommend. It's much more polished. It learned a lot from the first one. Mm -hmm. But weirdly, I couldn't get into it on replay. Not sure what to make of that. So it would rate above Evil Within 1. It's on the boundary. Yeah. It would be either... I'm going to be careful here because I feel like there's more to go in Resident Evil 4, but The Evil Within 2 deserves credit. It might be here, but I don't feel like putting it there at this time. Next, a game that you surely know a thing or two about, Amnesia, The Dark Descent. Never heard of it. You never heard of this, this genre-redefining title. Amnesia? Never heard of it. Okay. <laughs> 
No, I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't following that. I have, historically have 11 minutes of playtime on Amnesia in my <laughs> Steam oh my, okay. library. So you can see, yeah, found so it. So barely a brief visit to the main menu. I couldn't even walk a few steps and it already started. It introduces you to this panic mechanic. The sudden like vignette and weirdness of the screen was already enough to make me nervous. And then that's it. Amnesia did have a unusually quick start. That is also true for the Penumbra games. It has an intro, it doesn't just begin immediately, it's not the Doom style horror game. Almost like Cry of Fear. Cry of Fear has a, an explicit jump scare intro to get you going before the story starts. Also very interesting choice. So The Dark Descent, a mix of some interesting monster designs, a somewhat fantastical story set in a moody castle. Strong entry. I remember it was very famous at the time for being the game where you can't fight back, except for throwing, like, chairs at the monsters or whatever. Yes, for everyone who didn't play Penumbra, this was then the game that did all this. Yeah, I enjoyed it more than Outlast. As I said, the Dead Space Outlast perimeter here is the terror component that starts with these two. Yeah, and Amnesia is, is built on that terror. And comparing fractional games, I like the setting of Penumbra more, but Amnesia was still the more polished horror experience in general, so I like the more realistic, more almost Lovecraftian tones that Penumbra had, but Amnesia was still a stronger entry. Now is it stronger than Little Nightmares 1? Probably. It is stronger than these. I found the Cat Lady much more intriguing. The story in the Harvester Games titles is really something else. Very believable horror that you can dive into more than most of these titles. Yeah, stronger than Inside. That feels like a good place for Amnesia the Dark Descent. I'll give it I'll give it the point above Death Stranding, yeah. but here's where we stop for the moment because Resident Evil 2 with Mr. X. Yeah, yeah, that that's a if Amnesia had a free-roaming monster for most of its playtime, then we could talk. And then it would go past here, and then we would talk up here. Yeah, let's let's leave it like that. Ah, it's sequel o'clock with Amnesia, a machine for pigs. <laughs> this was developed by the Chinese Room, but it might as well have been developed by Bloober Team, because it's an empty shell. This is, please unrelease territory. It could be the least offensive of the mm -hmm. please unrelease games. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you stop playing Amnesia Machine for Pigs, it's because you couldn't be any less invested. And then you stop out of boredom. You're maybe frustrated because you expected something something else. Well, who knows? Who knows what took Amnesia Machine for Pigs down? I, I did play this a few hours, maybe. Steam would tell. It's just nothing. But choices are a bit tougher with Amnesia Rebirth. There are many things to like about Rebirth. Rebirth is flawed, but... It's like it tried so many great approaches, but it wasn't at all what you got from The Dark Descent. Even though this is a proper Frictional Games game, this wasn't a third-party entry. And I haven't finished it yet. I was just no longer in the mood for all the running around. I think I still like it more than Outlast 2. In Outlast, you just know what you see is what you get. It's very similar to Darkwood in that I liked where it was going, but then I no longer felt like going there. Somewhere here, somewhere here. In terms of playtime, I think I put more hours into the first Silent Hill than Rebirth. The point where Silent Hill 1 lost me was when I learned that I was now heading towards a bad ending, and the solution was to load a save point hours before oh, and no. enter a part of the town that I just didn't find, but that I even had the key for. So it just let me move past the thing that I had unlocked already. Maybe this still is uh, above there. Rebirth is very accessible. It's an easy to play game. Still miles ahead of Machine for Pigs. It's a confused game. Amazing ideas, almost Soma-like ideas in there, <laughs> but Soma was released before Rebirth and Soma, Frictional Games as well, this was the game that Frictional made after The Dark Descent. And this one, this one is an amazing game. I won't spoil much, but let's say it's the more sci-fi direction of A Dark Descent. 
And it's set in a very unique location. Yeah, great set pieces. Very um, dark, very grim in different ways. And explores a, a very practical science philosophical question in a very visceral way. Excellent writing, wonderful pacing, an incredible ending. It doesn't misdirect you. It's almost brutally honest. Like it has quite the runtime. It doesn't feel like you're constantly in a total state of horror. You have a lot of downtime to explore and like understand the story, but the horror factor still is is quite large. And I like with Oxenfree, I appreciated that there was more of an existential sort of story-based dread than there was just scared of getting jump scared. So definite recommendation. It's stronger than Dark Descent for sure. And it earns this place to being a more polished version from Frictional. To me, it must be Legend Status. Yeah, to totally. It's one of my absolute favorite games of all time. I would never play yeah. it again, but that probably only speaks yeah, for Yeah, you it's... wouldn't. You wouldn't. Yeah. I, 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 wouldn't, I, would, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Someday. But I love to watch Let's Play again. Mm. I might actually play it again. Wow, okay. So this is the only horror game in your catalog that you would replay I would yourself. never play a horror game, but this one I might actually play twice. That's how much I like it. So in the individual verses up here, it's it's much more polished than Underhell. It's also more polished than Condemned. Scarier on a broader level than Condemned. Friend Bao has more personal horror than the existential humanity-wide horror. Some of these are just raw terror, like Dead Space. Ah, uh, yeah, not sure if I, if I can put it above. It becomes very gameplay yeah. heavy here with the little exception here in the middle. I think for me, the reason I enjoyed it so much was because it wasn't that heavy on the horror in the end. And with Alien Isolation, I had to stop playing every 15 seconds. It does rely a lot on moments of fear of the unknown that you yeah. wouldn't get back or couldn't reproduce in replay. A trap that Underhell also falls into that I'm, I'm not sure if I would have too much fun just replaying it on my own, because a lot of the fun of Underhell was not knowing where this weird train was going. Mm -hmm. We are looking for a mix of enjoyability, scare factor, terror factor, and also a hint of replayability. Now, a game I forgot. We have Half-Life 2 on here. This is not the entirety of Half-Life 2, and for a change, I don't mean a mod for Half-Life 2. What this represents is just the Ravenholm section of Half-Life 2. Yes, okay. This is like a calibration tool for the rest of the tier list. So where the Ravenholm level goes, you can you can get a better feeling of what the other games that are now going to be to the left and right of it are in intensity. I can ask you, because you did play the Ravenholm level, so where would you put just the Ravenholm chapter? <laughs> so starting maybe with getting separated from Alex and Dog at the, the thing that separates the scrapyard from the rest of Black Mesa East until separating again from Father Grigori and seeing daylight again. So the first nighttime segment of Half-Life 2. So thinking back, playing Ravenholm for the first time at about 15 years of age, I um, most certainly quit the game and didn't touch it again for several months. It was specifically the fast zombies that did me in. Things coming at the screen very quickly are stressful. And then the fact that, you know, you have to reload your <laughs> shotgun and they come at you, they keep coming at you. And I ended up coming back to the game and sort of rushing through that section and just sort of running mm -hmm. and um, dying and trying again and then running and running and running um, and just sort of ignoring a lot of the enemies and somehow made it through. But the more recent time that I have played it, it was very doable. You know, it's an iconic sequence. Like almost everything of Half-Life 2. Yeah. Yeah, Half-Life 2 is an extremely, an extremely strong game and still today. It's also one of the many here that were foundations for much of what came after it. The original was released in 2004 and later part of the orange box that we all know with Portal uh, and Team Fortress 2. It also sparked the modding community that's still alive today. Something that we're going to see again with games that will follow here soon, soon after as well. I agree, Half-Life 2, the Ravenholm level should be rated with an iconic bonus. So even if it's not quite as effective today, yeah. This is one where we can all definitely remember how effective it was. I don't think it's necessarily legend status, but I enjoyed replaying it properly. And I think 
it is a recommendable experience. I think it's just over that terror line, because it does put you in a terror situation, even though it's very empowering with the shotgun and all that. It's difficult for me because I played Half-Life 2 more than 30, 40 times in in full. <laughs> so it feels just like a a nice, familiar, almost grandmotherly place going back to Ravenholm today for me. You know all the spots where like there's severed yeah, limbs uh, and, and half uh, torsos. Like. Yeah, all of it. Oh. Um, Half-Life 2 is a game I could speedrun in, in my sleep. Ravenholm is a very polished horror segment. You get introduced to different things. You meet more zombie types for the first time in the game. It's, of course, a nighttime chapter. But like much of Half-Life 2, it also relies a lot on scripted moments. And of course, scripted enemy placement. Not too much free roaming going around. There's the central section with the long road where new zombies will be spawning until you get through it. So it has some dynamic elements, but it's hard for me to to put it to put it somewhere here. But then again, it is obviously recommendable and I have already replayed it over 30, 40 times. But it's yeah. hard to measure against the others. Like I feel like it's more iconic to horror than Inside is. Less iconic to horror than Amnesia is. Yeah, maybe we have to we have to give it credit from memory. And I see the obvious argument here that of course I would say all of these things for Silent Hill 2 and 3 if I had the same kind of contact with it um, mm -hmm. that I had with Half-Life 2. Though Half-Life 2 is not primarily a horror game, even though it is strong in that regard, and it, it does enjoy to scare you on the occasion and give you some notably unexpected scary parts. Yeah, yeah, there's plenty of scariness in Half-Life outside of Ravenholm, like it's it, enough of it to compare it to something like Bioshock. But saying that just the Ravenholm chapter is stronger than the entirety of Inside feels a bit weird to me. Mm. I think the fair similarity would be comparing it with a, something else that is just a cut, <laughs> a cutout piece of something. Yeah, that's a good point. And this is where the comparison shines. Maybe PT is too high. <laughs> Maybe PT is more the above outlast, but not quite as strong as the entirety of Penumbra. And then it makes more sense putting it maybe above PT. But yeah, the Ravenholm level has more suspense and build-up than Outlast. Let's leave it there. Now we have Metro 2033 by 4A Games, the studio that was founded by previous GSC Game World developers, the developers of Stalker. It's set almost entirely in Metro Tunnels. It's an action game primarily, I think. Scariness is not its primary intent. Is it not? I remember it being very aggressive on like every monster you fight is some sort of horror creature. It's also a stealth game, yeah. but you're always armed and you can fight almost all of the scary things. It has Metro. It's like a dark stealth action game with some Bloober team levels inside. The game mechanical disease that the Metro games have is taking away interactivity and replacing it with walking simulator moments, unskippable cutscenes, and just a lot of clunkiness that you don't see at first. What I've always hated about the Metro games is how they don't let me play the most interesting parts. Cutscenes that take away your control. And Metro really has a lot of them, including Exodus. Exodus, which is mysteriously missing from this list, I see now. My gut instinct about Exodus, even though I haven't played it, is it's very linear, but it's comparably open and you have too much sort of power as a player in order to really feel trapped or hunted. At yeah, point. no, because it, it still puts you in confined spaces very quickly. Oh yeah? Hmm. But you just get to decide which of the confined spaces you want to check out in what order. I did like them. I didn't like them as horror games. When I returned to replay Metro 2033, it was for the stealth gameplay. Mm -hmm. More the setting. You get a, a unique setting from these. Yeah, in terms of horror, it's less than Outlast. It's recommendable. It's not frustrating, but it's annoying. Surprisingly fitting description. It, it really isn't a play and forget. It has its flaws, but it's not fundamentally flawed. If I was looking strictly for horror, then that would have been a difficult relationship. Some of these feel a bit unfair, but the clunkiness forces them into a play and forget. That's also the main issue of Resident Evil 4 is accessibility. All of these would have been so much better. Resident Evil Village, that one lacks substance. 
Village would be a beautiful looking walking simulator if you took away the, the combat. Until Dawn is almost stronger. And with almost, I mean it is. That's why I've changed them. Metro Lost Light, very similar, almost the same gameplay loop, similar tone and pacing. If you look at gameplay footage of both of these games, it would look exactly the same, with the small exception that Lost Light has more outdoor segments, but the outdoor still looks the same. I liked Lost Light more in my memory, but very, very similar. And now we have Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl, set in a slightly alternate timeline, but very present day, or from today's perspective in the past. The first Stalker came out in 2007, a horror action or action horror slight survival game set in the Chernobyl exclusion zone with its own kind of storytelling. And this one is entirely kept on life support by a very dedicated and I guess mostly Eastern European modding community. So we have to rate these as they were released, and I definitely played this one vanilla, once probably. And that's the issue. If Shadow of Chernobyl was never modded, it would be a pretty mediocre game. And I'm not sure if I would have ever replayed it if it was just that game. So I've, I'll give this one a very harsh, below Afraid of Monsters. Wow. Because even Afraid of Monsters is more polished than vanilla Shadow of Chernobyl. Yeah, okay. And this is a wow. mod for Half-Life 1. So in, <laughs> you could say it's it's like eight years older in the tech it's built on. And Stalker has its own engine, the infamous X-Ray, a name that most players know from the crash screen that you get. Shadow of Chernobyl, strong foundation for a game, but not really a good game on its own. I'm very glad that the mod community came around to make a proper game out of this in the years after its release. The ideas in this broken shell, is that enough to put it in decent? You're ranking it for potential, but that's like what the mods... No, I'm, I'm not ranking it for potential. I'm ranking it for what what is in vanilla and what is just realized with mods. Some of the things, the monster design is already in here. The laboratories. The controller. The scripted controller appearance in Agroprom. Just, actually, just the control, just the scripted <laughs> controller appearance in Agroprom is enough of an iconic horror moment that it has to move up a little bit for that. Even Vanilla is probably stronger than Slender. It's stronger than Bioshock 2. So it, it moves above some of these. More than Village, but less than Until Dawn. The, the polish boundary here. We do have a game that can take the place where I put the other one, which is Stalker Clear Sky. It's funny that the um, Ukrainian game is sitting at the Polish border. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> That's, that definitely is a joke. Stalker Clear Sky, which interestingly says on its cover Prologue, which is true. Mm -hmm. It's set before the events of Shadow of Chernobyl. I always like the environments it's set in marshland and has some, some earlier versions of other levels inside. It had the city of Limansk. But this one was even boggier on release, and it had some faction war mechanics that were very interesting, but didn't fit at all in, in a Stalker game. So this one is somewhere here. It's flawed, and it would lose you. I think it has to go below the Silent Hill games. Yeah, maybe it can sit here with the other weird Eastern European entry with Cryostasis. <laughs> it's probably less polished than Cryostasis. We can give Prey this spot. Much stronger entry with the third and last Stalker game to ever release, Call of Pripyat. This is a much more open, the most polished, released in 2009. This one was the closest to the true Stalker formula that is now kept alive with mods. Very open environments, more planning, more open missions, more like investigate this thing and then you make your own way and less linear levels and some creepy underground stuff. I think the, the creepy laboratories are the hallmark stalker. Mm -hmm. It still had its difficulties on release, but it must be at least above the first one. That's really the one that started it all. And I think the horror in Call of Pripyat is much more effective than Metro. So if Metro can sit here and last light here, 
then it must be better than these two. Stalker as a series is, at least in concept, much stronger than the Metro series. Here it becomes difficult. What holds Call of Pripyat back is still too many mistakes during development. Mistakes that the Quarry didn't make, that Dead Space 2 didn't make, and Outlast didn't make. But there is a special placement here. This is the stand-in for modded Stalker. Mainly Stalker Anomaly and its many predecessors like Misery, Call of Chernobyl, Call of Misery, the many things that followed it. So this is a, a summary game, you could say, that was in development from 2009 to current year. What I mainly mean with this is Misery and Anomaly. And this is very intense. Probably one of the most intense gameplay experiences that you can have. Yeah. And not only in terms of horror, but also in terms of action and an extremely strong survival game. Very interesting world, very unique world design, very threatening. Stalker Anomaly, definitively legend status. This is what Stalker always wanted to be mm -hmm. in my mind. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see if the new founder GSC Game World, um, the Ukrainian developer, will agree with what the mod community did in a combined development time that is more than the original developer put into their trilogy. Even the game engine is open sourced today. And this is of course stronger than Underhill. And it's of course stronger than Condemned. Because with the modded content, we're talking about the combined content of all the three games. A lot of different environments, very open world, not anything in terms of plot or story development there. This is an entirely gameplay focused experience. And what we said before, there's a division line here where the games start to become more and more mechanical. And that's definitely true for Stalker, so... Easily. Yeah, we're now, we're approaching fear territory with the kind of gameplay that we get here. Now, the next predicate, predictability. Mm -hmm. Because even fear, with its amazing AI, the horror part of fear is very scripted. So we're going to move past them, try to approach games where the horror moves in unpredictable ways. I played your fully modded Stalker build once, only once. Mm -hmm. And it made an in intense impression on me. I don't know why we never continued to play it, but yeah, it was... It's a question for you, not I me. mean, <laughs> well, yeah. All that we did was I packed up some stuff, some like supplies, and I went out. All I did was walk down the road, sort of hike through some grass, and then suddenly some guys showed up out of nowhere, started shooting at me. I hid behind some cover, shot one of them. He ran away, I think. I looted the, the guy and realized how intense, short this firefight was, how completely unpredictable. I didn't know where they were half of the time, and it just felt very, very real. I had to circle around their camp and figure out the best way to approach. This whole experience felt much less like a video game. It felt like role-playing in action sequence. The unique experience that arose from just many, many mechanics working together. Yeah, a game that always had this kind of soul but it was hidden away and chained to the buggy mess that was its original release. Yeah, absolutely. That, that exact experience, the epitome of what the idea behind the Stalker experience was, even in the original book. Yeah. What we got to see with everything that followed the release of the Misery mod was the unbounded potential that was always part of Stalker. It still felt like a game that you might see vanilla, but freed unchained to terrorize you, where just walking down a sunny path can be frightening. It's immersive sim horror. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So predictability, because the world of Stalker is so breathing and weirdly alive, also allows for great replayability, which is a, a big plus here. I don't want to jump ahead to Alien, but with Alien, the story eventually doesn't matter. You can still replay it because it's so unpredictable. We don't know how the alien would move in any level. We know yeah. the first appearance, and that's it. And Stalker doesn't even have this first appearance to rely on. But it also is a bit directionless, one of the few negatives here. All that said, the absence of story is one of the main comparatives to The Last of Us. With a respectful nod to the extremely strong story that's told here, we still move past especially on replay, Stalker Anomaly will be far scarier. And for the exact same reasons, it also moves past Doki Doki Literature Club. 
It's almost like an engine. It's a system of systems with emergent narratives that are your very own unique horror stories. Emergent horror. It is, interestingly, what the new developers of the Dead Space brand are now trying with the remake of Dead Space 1. Dead Space 2023, where they want to have repopulation in parts of the station. Where you have an open world and return to a place from before, but there might be monsters again, monsters in different places, so some systems to populate this station. That said, the original Dead Space didn't have these, so we also moved past Dead Space here, without a doubt. This is not a, a difficult decision, I think. So now, Cry of Fear, very strong entry, doesn't have emergent horror, it's very scripted, it's just very intense, excellent monster design. Also these things Stalker also has, so I think one of the few games that can beat the terror of Cry of Fear. Here it's now, again, a fight for polish. Well that's a fight that Stalker is gonna lose, probably. The atmosphere of the zone is hard to describe, keeping you on edge, but it also has a comfort. Like Doki Doki, it has a special energy besides the horror. Something like Stalker normally stands above the scary segments of The Last of Us Part 2. I even think, in terms of terror, we're going to have to make this change here as well, I think. So here you get a break to solve things. Here you also solve puzzles more in quiet places. Cry of Fear plays with your fear quite literally and lets you solve puzzles, sometimes in quiet places, but sometimes while being hunted. If Stalker had puzzles, you would always be hunted, no matter what's going on. Alien Isolation does this deliberately, as a conscious design decision. Stalker is not a stronger horror game than Alien Isolation. There is constant dread in both of these, a lot of unpredictability. If Alien didn't have the Alien AI, it probably wouldn't even be in Legend status. The distinction would be Stalker has more systems, but the number of systems that work to scare you... Mm. And again, even heavily modded Stalker, the extreme dismissal of polish of the original games still shows. Like, mm. models, detail in the maps, the engine that strains on having to provide the graphical fidelity of a maybe 2017 era game on a 2007 last updated engine. It can't beat in Isolation. You know, I was really hoping for a twist here. Yeah, no. Just no. <laughs> and one last bonus with the Dreadx collection. Collection of Game Jam games. Closing out on a nice little recommendation, I think, right? Yeah, this is a, a recommendation. It's not play and forget, there are some interesting things. This is a stand-in for the three Dreadx collections. These are mostly short experiences, but with some very nice ideas. I think it gives us, yeah, it gives us a bit more polish than Downfall. I'm not so sure about this, actually. <laughs> because Downfall, you can't ignore Downfall as the, the predecessor to these two masterpieces up here. Maybe it's just the solid base that all our recommendations can sit on. I think DreadX is no doubt recommendable to just check the collection, the huge variety it has. But there are plenty of games in there that are just not really noteworthy. DreadX sits on a broken scale of effective horror and the clunkiness of a game jam experiment. But because it has all of these in collections, it gets hard to evaluate. So I'm going to give it this honorable place because it is more than decent in parts of it and you won't quite forget parts of it. And that is the list. Going all the way from the worst game in a list, Dead Space 3, being the third game doesn't seem to do them much good here. Yeah, Dead Space has an incredible range. Not only did they take worst game, but also they are <laughs> among the best. The Dead Space franchise takes the prize for largest range of quality. Yeah, we got the whole spectrum. We have the games of our lifetime, from the worst with Dead Space 3, and the best with Alien Isolation. This is the definitive horror game tier list of all the titles of our lifetime. Do you want to do a little goodbye or thank you for watching or something? Not sure if it's funnier if it just suddenly cuts out.